day, whatever suits you better. Um, I'm not going to talk for long. I just am aware that there are some people that weren't here yesterday. So I want to welcome you, um, help you feel at ease, know that you're amongst friends or friends to be. I know some people don't know anybody. Please just feel free to say hello to the person who happens to be sitting next to you at any session that you're in or when you're out there having lunch or chats in between. Um, this is your chance to connect with new people, see people you haven't seen since before the pandemic, learn, um, share your expertise, things that are just obvious to you that will be amazing to somebody here today. I've already had a few of those moments this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me or weren't here yesterday, my name is Zoe Kinstone and I'm the Director of Clubs. So that means that um, I work for the Raspberry Pi Foundation and I oversee both Code Club and Code Dojo. So it's wonderful for me to be here over these few days, seeing a few familiar faces, but mainly getting to meet people whose names I've heard or seen written down um, or just hear the passion from people that I've never heard about before because there's so many wonderful people in our community. Um, in terms of what is happening today, if you haven't spotted it yet, all of our staff are in black t-shirts. So you'll see either this logo, the Raspberry Pi one, or the Co Club logo, or the Coda Dojo logo. Don't hold back. If you want to come and talk to us, we would all love to talk to you about what you do. Uh, if you need help with anything, finding anything, any questions, if you're presenting, you're not sure what's happening, please just don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and we will be happy to help you or figure out how to help you. Um, and we would also love to hear from you about how we can support you. So it's our role at the foundation to produce resources for you, to run events like this. Um, and we want to do them as well as possible so that it works for each and every one of you. So um, if you have feedback or just ideas about not even events, just anything at all, please, please don't hold back. Just, yeah, please feel free to, to talk to any of us at any point. Um, I think that is all I'm going to say in terms of introduction, because I'm aware I don't want to take up all of Jane's time. So the first presentation we've got is from Jane Waite, who is our research manager at the foundation. Super lucky to have her here today. She was a developer for 20 years and then uh, worked in a primary school for 10 years and is now working in research. And she has lots of uh, useful information to share about how we can use the research that is going on at the foundation in clubs in particular. So I really hope that you enjoy her talk and the rest of the day, and I will see you later on. Thank you. So thank you so much to Zoe for introducing me, but most importantly, I'm just so excited to be here with you. One of my passions is about community and the fact that you're here as a community to learn and share is just brilliant. So I'm Jane White. As I said, I worked in the industry for 20 years. I had a pager in my pocket as we flipped over from 1999 to 2000, I've got people nodding, and the batch cycle did not fall over, and so the banking system was up the next day. But then I was a teacher for 10 years, and then because of my strange kind of experience of being both a developer and a teacher, I got picked up to work on various Department for Education curriculum resource kind of activities. I worked in community building. I even did some training in industry of, around computer science education. And now I work in research and I, I think I've been doing that about eight years now. And I work for, and I am so proud to work for this group. I work for the Raspberry Pi Computing Education Research Center, which is a joint initiative between the University of Cambridge and the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And we're all about investigating how we can engage all children to be able to take part in computer science and computing and associated subjects. And we cover an age band of students from three years old all the way up to 19. But to be honest, it's not just about children, it's about you. It's about educators, volunteers, it's about teachers, it's about our whole community. And one of the big aims that we have is around broadening participation. And that's one of our big areas of research. But we call it culturally relevant pedagogy. And <laughs> there is a woeful, it kind of actually makes me really cross. There's a woeful underrepresentation of both females, girls, and also black students who take post-14 qualifications 
and that's GCSEs, iMedia, uh, A-level, T-levels. Um, I used to teach on the big undergraduate module, Introduction to Java, at Queen Mary University of London. We had 500 students. There were so few girls. And I don't, I'm not convinced. I'd be really interested to talk to developers now. Are there more women in computing than there was in the 80s? I get the impression we've not cracked that. And what is this culturally relevant pedagogy? Well, it's, the theory is if we can make learning meaningful and accessible and relevant to young people, then they're more likely to move along. But it's not about just the jobs. When I think about being in the developer, it was about all voices being in the room as we're designing systems. And also, it's about supporting everybody to be a discerning consumer and an active creator in this increasingly kind of digital world. And we've done all sorts of cool kind of research in this area. But one of the things we did is we've, we kind of created this. It's bizarre to see an actual physical copy of something. Um, and this is the first opportunity for you in terms of your clubs and what you can do in terms of using research to inform your practice. Get hold of one of these. It's hard to get the actual physical copy, but you can download it. It's some guidelines created by educators for educators about how you can start to change your practice to make it more culturally relevant. And we also then got some very lovely money, we got some funding from Google, and we operationalized these and we took them into schools. And there are, in fact, some people in this room now who took part in that research, but I can't say who they are. And they took some fabulous risks and they made some really big differences to their practice. We've also then managed to get some another bit of little pot of money from Cognizant. I have to say a big shout out to them, so thank you. And we're researching how in primary schools we can adapt resources. So we're kind of there's some really cool things happening. And you're kind of part of that because you're part of our family. You're part of our Raspberry Pi Foundation family. And that research feeds into the resources you use. The other big area of research that we're very excited about is in AI education. You can come and talk to me and I'll completely nerd out about it. Uh, as you all know, ChatGTP, if you're a developer, you're probably using Copilot. Uh, if you are an undergrad, if you're kind of in any kind of undergraduate setting, and you're really worried about uh, these, these products because of the plagiarism for students in examinations. What have we done in terms of where we're working? Right, another opportunity. We, we run seminars. So once a month, we kind of get international researchers to come along and share their research. And we did that actually a little time ago. Um, and we had, I, can, I kind, of, kind of fangirl on this, but the best researchers who are talking about things that they're doing in this field watch the video of Matti Teadre who's from Finland and I'd also recommend the video or the recording from Carsten Schult the German group who are doing research in this area so that's another thing so you can watch that and that can help you learn more about this topic um, we've done a little pilot survey of teachers motivations we did a literature review of research but the best thing was we looked at 500 resources we actually really did look at 500 resources that teach about AI and machine learning and from that we learned so much and that has then informed we've supported the RPF team who the Raspberry Pi team who've developed lessons and a challenge which you, you'll be able to use in your club. And I think Mark Leia, he's going to be presenting on that about, about using AI and machine learning, teaching about AI and machine learning in, in your settings. And here we've got ooh, a proper big opportunity for you. We're about to start to research not what we teach about AI and machine learning, but how we might use machine learning in the teaching and learning of programming. Very excited about that. And you'll see dotted around various QR codes and you can apply to take part in that research study. So I mentioned before research seminars, please come. They're once a month on a Tuesday. We always have industry people. We always have volunteers. We always have teachers. And it's a great way to learn about research and then to talk to people about how it might impact on what you do. So come along. 
a taste of significant research. Because I said I was going to kind of give you things that you could take away, I wanted to give you some big ticket items. This is not our research. This goes back in time. So I'll just let you read that. Novices must be able to read 50% of their code, that's tracing code accuracy, before they can independently write code with confidence. This was research done by some Australians and New Zealanders, massive big research project for undergraduates quite a long time ago now. It kind of makes sense. If you can't read something, then how are you going to go about writing it? But notice it says 50%, not 100%. 50% they found was about kind of that's the, that's the amount that they need to be able to kind of read with some kind of accuracy before they can make progress. And that research has moved on. It kind of underpins much of the research that has followed and also practice and resources that have been developed. And this is a, some super, super research by Lauren Margula and Barbara uh, and Brianna Morrison, who are in the States. And they talked about worked examples. So if you imagine you've got to learn how to read code, it's like you've got to have a good book in order to learn how to, learn how to read in literacy, then you need a good program to be able to learn how to read programs. But they talked about something called sub-goal labels. And it's this idea that you summarize a block of code with functionally what it's trying to achieve. And they found a profound impact on learning to program by just adding these little labels. So this is not about tracing, this is about summarizing. And so if you've got students who are maybe struggling to learn, to make progress and to write code, go back, can they read 50%? And then mm, in the examples I'm giving them, has it got these labels? And the last one is how do we sequence learning? And this is some research by um, Irene Lee, big group of researchers got together and they came up with this use modify, create. I start off, I use stuff that's not mine, but then it gradually becomes mine as I move to the create phase. But what does this research look like in practice? We're not kind of just sitting in our ivory towers. We want to see how it actually impacts how, what you do in your clubs and in classrooms. And so I picked three, two, one, make. And I think there's quite a few sessions today where we're going to talk about that. And it's this pathway of being able to learn how to program. And I think you can use these resources created by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And it covers all these different subjects, or sorry, these different programming languages. And what does 321 path look like? So you have three projects that are all about explore. Then you have two about design and one that's about event. Oh, that sounds a little bit, little bit like use, modify, create. And by George it is. So these are the different um, sum, only sum, sum of the research theories that have been put into practice by the people who developed these resources at the foundation. So you've got the use as you explore the project. It's tightly scaffolded and it manages something called cognitive load. If you want to know more about the theories under that, then I can give you those details. It also has this thing of constructionism. Put your hand up if you've heard of Papa. Papert, he's a big dude in terms of all of this work that we do, particularly in non-formal contexts, I think, and to some extent in schools. But it's this idea that you are making something in order to construct your knowledge, and then you share it. So it's about, then that's throughout the, 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 the kind of the framework. Assessment for learning, you don't often see that in non-formal, but actually, it makes a lot of sense. And it's the work of Black and Williams. It's really important if you're in formal education. But the way that it's implemented in terms of this framework is through points of reflection. So it's points where we are young people, they kind of stop and think, what is it that I've learned? What was it that I was supposed to learn? What do I need to do next? And that's just formative assessment. So there's points of reflection. And then when the, in each of these, there's kind of a focus on some of the, those theories. And good, there's worked examples, and there's the sub-goals. And then the culturally relevant pedagogy, I think it does particularly feature as you move into the invent, so the use, modify, and then the create. 
and it is about projects being relevant to students and meaningful to students because that's what they find inspiring and also they feel successful. There's lots of research around this importance of being successful. And in order to support them to be successful, what we have to do is we have to manage the cognitive load, scaffold their learning through these kind of research informed techniques and instructional approaches. So, I'm gonna finish early, Jan. <laughs> How can you find out more? Uh, we have this thing about research that we need to transfer it from the ivory tower. We need then to translate it so that you can understand it because the way that we write for academic conferences is hideous. Mm -hmm. And then you need to transform it. And what that means is you take it and you make it your own. And you can do that by, if you do use the three, two, one resources, then there's a mentor guide that has links off to the research. You can subscribe to Hello World, they're out there. We have research pieces in there, not just by us, but by other research teams. Um, you can read the guidelines. You can, oh, we did, I forgot to tell you, we did a, what's called, a, we always start with research studies where we do what's called a literature review. We basically go and see what everyone else has done and then we write it up so we can build on it and learn on it, learn from it. And we did a non-formal literature review all to do with um, yeah, how you teach in clubs and summer camps. And there is a video by the people who wrote it from the non-formal team. It's really, really good. And then you can read the paper if you really want to nerd out. Please come to our research seminars because I love them and it's community. So please come along. And I could set up some breakout rooms that are just for, say, Code Dojo or Code Club members so that then you can talk about your context and see, well, what does this research mean for us? So if you're interested in that, come and find me and that's something I could set up. Um, register for our research newsletter and also register interest to take part in our learning to program with machine learning code generators pilot study. Gosh, that's hard to say. So let me explain it to you. There are uh, QR codes dotted around. Um, you scan the QR code and you can apply to take part. It's four clubs where you have got 13 to 15 year old students who are learning Python. We don't want expert Python programmers. We kind of want novices and intermediates. We're going to do think aloud um, kind of research with them and interview them to find out what they think to co-pilot and to learning with these program generators. And we're gonna do the same with you because it's not just about what the children or the young people think, but it's what you think in terms of volunteers and educators. So then we can find out more about how should we teach AI and machine learning and how should we use these tools in learning to program. So please catch me during the breaks and chat to me about research. I can, as many of those of you who know me already, I can bore you silly about it. I'm Jane Waite on Twitter, please kind of, I know there's lots of issues about Twitter, but we do still have a bit of a community there. Um, and that's the end. So, thank you.
Aberdeenshire in Scotland. It's lovely to be with you today. Our school is now seven years old. There are 19 classes in it and 505 pupils. We're the biggest school in Aberdeenshire now. Uh, at the moment, I have got 25 pupils that are members of Hillside Coding Club, predominantly primary sevens, and I have three primary three, primary sixes. There, there are about 16 at the moment on the waiting list, waiting to get in, and they'll get first shot next year when we're in primary seven. My role at our coding club is really to be a facilitator. As the coding club um, say, to give every child a chance to get the skills, confidence and opportunity to change the world, I'm there to facilitate that as well, to provide opportunities to enable this to become possible. I want the children to dream, believe and achieve and reach their goals. In Scotland, we've got four fundamental um, capacities that lie at the heart of our curriculum for excellence. As you'll see, what these are up there. At Coding Club, we want our learners to thrive in a world that's interconnected, digital and changing so fast. At Coding Club, endeavour to maximise opportunities to develop the capacities, making clear links with the future, life and work. In the words of one of our Coding Club members, what? Not every school in the world has got a Coding Club? Hmm. Says, oh, well, our Tuesday Coding Club, everyone should, should have one. That child went in and said after that as well. So you're going to hear just now um, quite a few snippets today, for, actually coming from the pupils. This is not rehearsed. They didn't have a script or anything. This is coming from their heart about what, first of all, they think about Coding Club. This is one of our new members this year. So in Coding Club, um, I came and I had no idea about coding or um what it was about so i was curious about what it was and i went and they were very welcoming and then during time um i enjoyed it more and more and um now i really like it and enjoy it coming every tuesday also um i've learned a lot from coding like um I've learned how to uh, make projects on Scratch, and I've I didn't use Scratch until I joined Coding Club, and make Code Arcade, and I found um, it now easier when I first started because I learned how to um, do it, and now um, I feel like I'm better, and now I've got more um, confidence in um, making um, projects. In with Scratch and Make Code Arcade. So at the start of the season this year, I did a little bit of a survey about the pupils' attitudes, the skills they had, and their confidence in, in coding. And this was part of a digital extra fund as well that we've been granted a grant this year to give our children extra opportunities. So it's meant we actually haven't had as much time actually in the, the classroom situation to be working on projects as normal. But on the leverage scale, you'll notice the numbers are going up gradually. Hopefully, by the next time that we do this at the end of the year, I'm hoping that it will all be up in positive numbers to show that their coding skills in the areas of, um, that we've been focusing on have hopefully improved. Also, the attitude as well, you'll notice that's gone up a total of 16.5% um, from the previous scores from first doing this um, survey at the start of the session as well. Um, when the children, actually you'll notice, uh, voted a number one about her attitude to be begin with, and that's because I just discovered last week that her dad told her she should come along to Coding Club because it would look good in her CV for the future. So she gave it a shot and she says, mm, I quite like it now. It's, it's getting growing on me, she said as well. And the confidence levels. Um, you'll notice a big shift and the blue, the blue is the, um, the positive, more positive kind of scorings as well, especially with Scratch and Make Code Arcade. And I'm hoping that it'll be all blues by the end of the year as well. A big focus though at our club has been on the skills development as well. Um, the meta skills allowed that when we were going over this as well, when the children were reading out loud what the questions were, asking, do they think they developed these skills? They went, yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow, yes, of course we do that at Coding Club. So it sounded very positive when, when that was actually getting done last week as well. So we're now going to focus on the meta skills and the children themselves are going to tell you specifically how they feel about the development of those and how that has actually progressed their learning at our club. 
First of all, Skills Development Scotland have got a model of skills to develop Scotland's future, and these higher order thinking skills um, are adaptive to learners and promote success in whatever the context for the future will bring them. The first context, self-management, uh, focusing, integrity, adapting, and initiative. And the people voice. So when I was about to join, I felt excited because it was a new opportunity. But then after a few weeks, it started to get a bit difficult. And then I realised I needed to ask for help. And then after I got help, it just like became a lot more fun because I understood how to do it. I just did how to do it. So when something doesn't work when I'm coding, um, I just try to see the, the um, other um, things I can use and not give up because if you give up then you will never know if you can do it. I really enjoy Coding Club because it's a chance for me to um, learn more about coding and making animations and games in an environment where I know people support me and having someone there that knows a lot about coding um, helps as well because um, there's quite a few tricky elements to coding club is it's um, from being able to figure out um, how to, to debug code Oops, sorry going too fast and onto social intelligence so I've um, communicated better because I didn't really talk to people at first I can prevent stuff from people. When I was in second grade, I started talking to more people and socialising a bit more than I used to. And Kidney Club has helped me socialise more and has built my confidence more than it actually was before. They helped me like socialise with other people in the groups that we are in. And yeah. It's leadership because I feel like I can help people with things a lot more than I was last year and I feel like I'm much better at leading. My team and I, um, we were like a really good team. We work together, we solve problems together. Um, we all have a shot if we want to do the same thing. Um, one of the main parts is like working well with your team and um, sorting things out with your team. So you have to have like good teamwork and stuff. My leadership skills have developed increasingly because when you work on projects and games as a group, you can help support and um, conduct lots of operations with your friends who are in Coding Club as well to make one huge group project that will make you all very happy and proud. And it makes you feel good to have your project like made so you can actually see your creativity come into being. And next, the meta skills innovation. These are ones that are really prevalent at our club for the curiosity, creativity, sense making, and critical thinking skills. In the pupils' voice, my favorite thing about coding club is just being able to make anything you want. Because usually games are very limiting. So if you want to buy a game, it usually just ends once you play it a lot and you just finish the game but with coding club you learn how to code your own games and you could and you have a lot of freedom with what to code you can use your own ideas and it's just very fun to make to make games and expand on them yeah. my favorite thing about coding club is that in a Whenever you, whenever you have ideas for the game, there's always so much possibilities you can make and how, especially when you're working with other people, you can always expand what happens in the game, like more things happen and, what, and whatever the characters are. It's a, it always makes the game more interesting and that's what I like about Coding Club the most. So when I joined Coding Club, my confidence went that high. So as I joined Coding Club and I got used to going every Tuesday, my confidence went better and I have new friendships with other people now. And when 
my friends when I agreed to I didn't want to, so I made them ask for me, and now I can just basically ask anyone for anything if I need help during coding club. And my creativity is so much better now, so that is one skill that I really appreciate. Through like projects, and it's helped my creativity. And um, it's now easier when I first started because I learned how to um, do it and now um, I feel like I'm better and now I've got more um, confidence in, in making um, projects in with Scratch and Make Code Arcade and also um, I feel like um, my um, ideas have got better, like more creativity in making games. Okay, and this is how we organise our coding club. We mostly use the Scratch projects and the modules. Children work through them linearly, but there will be times that think they ask me, I want to do this, so can you help me? Is there any way we can um, do this? And we kind of research and try and help them out as well. Some of their favourite projects are the ones that, that are up there. And the boat race is actually one that in June um, last year that a group of their final primary seven pupils um, decided they'd like to do a showcase evening. They invited along the parents and caters and they actually led the session and showed them how to code it. And it was a great success. They, they were given you know, their ownership and leadership there. And it's something that the children have asked again to do this year similarly as well. When they're completing the project, they make it their own, they change um, you know, the, co the code in it, they change the sprites, they um, just do things with it once they've made the general project code as well, and that's what they really enjoy and are always proud of their achievements. We've also been using microbits at Hillside Coding Club, because every school in Scotland Scotland received 20 of these last year and the Microsoft Make Code website is something that we use along with other resources out there and this has been extending and enhancing the learners experiences and very much enjoyed particularly the whack-a-mole we've had whack Santa we've had all sorts of variations that the children came up with after that now, I asked the children what they enjoyed most of all about Coding Club, and you'll see resoundingly robotics is actually the one that's coming up there, along with fun and everything. That sees it all, doesn't it? Coding Club should be fun, engaging, and meet the needs of the members. The world of work has been something that we've been focusing on as well, and we've had workshops from Education Scotland on ed ethical hacking. We've had people in to speak to us about their job roles. Here we have Gordon from Open Planet Software, and he really inspired our learners just a couple of weeks ago. He came in and talked to them about how as a scout leader, he wanted to record people very quickly one night, and he had a great big group of, of the scouts to do this in in such a short time. So he actually went away and he actually coded an app, used it, then afterwards thought, wait a minute, if I can use it for this, this is something that might be you know, useful for people out there. And that's actually how the Just Press Record app was created for Apple. Um, Open Planet Software created that, and it's a big seller now for Apple as well. So the children felt really motivated that he thought, right, there's a problem out there that I could, I'm needing help with. And he was telling them as well, at the moment he's working on a musical concept because he's a musician himself and he wants to be able to do something. He wasn't going to tell us all the details, of course, but he'll told us he'll share with us in the future once the app's finished. Um, at Coding Club, we've got two thirds of our members are actually girls. The pupils will say themselves here just now about how this empowers them and that gender makes no difference at all at our club. At my coding club, two thirds of our members are female. And I think this empowers me because it makes me feel better and it makes me feel that more women could go on to do STEM subjects such as technology and like coding and data handling. Two thirds of our coding club are female, and um, this is really interesting because um, there has been many female 
um, people who have gone into STEM subjects such as coding and technology and have done some amazing, amazing things um, were in like a male orientated workspace where people think that um, it, the work is, that, that that job is just for males. Um, for example, Ada Lovelace, she made the first computer and people didn't think that she'd be able to do it. One, because of the computer, like what they had at the time, and two, because they believed that only men could do coding and technology. There are also lots of other women who have managed to um, achieve amazing things and speak out for um, our rights, um, which I think is amazing and how people underestimate the power of women. At our club this year, one thing that we did was we um, kind of tried to make relevant um, the learning and focus on um, the global goals. So the children had to pick a global goal and then they had to create a project that was something that would make other people kind of learn about that global goal in some part as well. And this gave the children a great big sense of achievement. Some of them are still actually tweaking their projects just now. They won't give me tell me they're totally finished yet because they keep going back, adding to them, changing elements of them. That's something else they've discovered in their learning and they incorporate that as well. So a little bit of information about this as well. Um, next year, I'm thinking that we're going to focus on children's rights and do a similar kind of project as a motivatory thing for the pupils. What I'm really proud of, we'd have to do my Global Goals project again because I, I worked really hard on it and it's taken me a long time to do and I think it's turned into a really good project. For the Global Goals project that we had, we had an idea for Hungry Hippos, but the code was like extremely hard to make. So we went on the Code Club website and we tried to make the animation, which we are almost finished with, the Panda animation. Um, and I really enjoyed kind of the way all the, the blocks works in that situation. In the words of our learners, here are some of their favourite things that they enjoy most of all about coming to Coding Club. The favourite thing about Coding Club is just being able to make anything you want. Because usually games are very limiting. So if you want to buy a game, it usually just ends once you play it a lot and you just finish the game. But with Coding Club, you learn how to code your own games and you could and you have a lot of freedom with what to code. You can use your own ideas and it's just very fun to make to make games and expand on them. What I like about coding club is that it's not just games you get to do, it also teaches you a lot about other stuff. There is a lot of stuff in your daily life about coding club. But it is fun to make games because not long ago I made my first game. And even though it was a tutorial, it really made me feel really proud because I never knew I was capable of making state stuff like game. So I know how to make characters, backgrounds, and I kind of think my characters move and stuff. So I do hope that soon I'll get to make like proper games without following tutorials. And it's really fun. So if I had to recommend doing coding club, I would. Now you're going to hear from the Coding Club members how they have been inspired to think ahead for their future and the skills and the workforce that's out there. I just enjoyed Coding Club because I thought joining something new is good and also when I grow up it would be like an opportunity to see like more jobs like if you have a lot of skills yeah join the group. The reason why I came to Coding Club is because I always wanted to become a coder and have my own business. So I thought like this Coding Club was an opportunity for me to start getting into coding. So ever since I joined Coding Club, I found out a lot of new jobs and um, about coding, which use coding and but I and jobs that I can use my skills for. 
and I really needed this because I was stuck and I was not sure on what jobs to or on what career I wanted to have. So coding club really made me more curious about jobs and just careers. And that curiosity as well, his older brother's just won a big award for something that he created at secondary school and he was a member of a previous coding club um, four years ago as well. So the future, what's our future hold at Hillside? Here's the vision from one of our pupils. Um, after Hillside Coding Club, there has been, we have had a lot of help from the Digital Extra Fund um, to let us go on trips and see um, all the jobs that are out there using coding and STEM subjects. Uh, for example, we went on a trip to the Aberdeen Science Centre and we got to see tons of things that involved coding and um, seeing how they would work and what kind of jobs and things that they could help with in the future. Um, the Digital Extra Fund has also helped us to um, buy new things for our coding club, such as we just got a Marty the Robot, um, which is a very expensive piece of kit and wouldn't otherwise been able to get. We also managed to get meow bits and micro bits um, due to this fund as well, which um, I find really, like, they're very fun to um, use and actually be able to have something physical to play, like, to be able to code. And for the future of Coding Club, um, I think it's going to, is probably going to get a lot bigger, a lot more people are going to be interested in Coding Club. They're also thinking about um, doing a showcase where we can showcase all our learning that has happened in Coding Club um, at the end of the year, which is when we'll have all our robots up and running. Um, and we'll also showcase games that we've made as well using Scratch and Make Code Arcade. At our coding club end of year showcase, there will be stalls, and people and parents will get to see what our, what the kids have been up to at the coding club, and they'll get to see like our robots and how we code them, and how we work stuff, and all the games we've made, and I think that'll be really interesting for them, because like if they really get into into coding club, then then they'll probably want a job in the future to do with it but like we put no pressure on them at all to do that um also i think that across the uk or at least across the or like at most across the world every school should have a coding club and finally the future of coding beyond our classroom hi my name is Indian. i'm part of the Hillside coding club so in the future of coding, I feel that we need to get more people into coding and learning about coding, even if it's just the different languages, because code is in everything that we use, even if it's the washing machine or your iPad or phone, it's everywhere. Plus the fact that maybe 10 years now, from now, more job opportunities will come up. Most of them may involve code, considering the fact that technology is evolving every single day, every single month. So just really getting more people into coding would create more job opportunities and would help to make the world a bigger and better place. So thank you very much everyone for listening today. You'll have noticed that there's a high diversity in our school at Hillside. A lot of those peoples there are either Russian, we've got Polish, we've got Kazakhstan, Ghana and, um, and other countries as well. So my job, as I say, is to try and inspire the future and promote lifelong learning amongst people that come to our coding club at Hillside. I can't thank the Raspberry Pi Foundation and Code Club for all their support that they've given me since I started at Hillside. It's been so valuable and I just hope our partnership continues in years to come until I retire. So thank you very much for listening. Please um, follow my school on Twitter and my own personal Twitter handle as well. Thank you.
Hi everyone. So my name is Rodri Smith and I'm here to talk about assistive technology and how maybe that can benefit your club. Um, so just to give you a little taster of our, our club, um, I run it, a club in Cubitt Town Primary School. Um, it's every Thursdays we have, well I started a couple of years ago and it was just year five and six. But this year, I've noticed that the age has decreased um, significantly. So year three, four, five, and six want to take part. And that really brought a big question of how I can support the lower um, ability children, how I can support children that are younger, um, and yeah, to give them access to the learning. So just to give you a little, little flavor, here's some Raspberry Pi project paths that we have. We've been doing the boat race um, at the top. Uh, we've got Hour of Code at the top there, so um, yeah, they have access to that. We have Code Club World, which we used um, over there. So that was a really good way of um, introducing Python into our club, because we went from Scratch in World 1, Scratch in World 2, to Python. And that was a really nice way of introducing Python um, to our students. Uh, we also have Python here with Astro Pi, and that was a good way of introducing it as well to our oldest children and then we also were part of the pilot project where we had the introduction to scratch this is when this is actually a digital version that i created um so we were sent the copies of the um uh copies of this but i put it into a digital format using google jamboard and this was complete in just one week so i give it i gave it out to the students i introduced it as a as a project and within one week one of the students had already filled in all of this all of the stickers and completed it all in one go. So um, we also have physical computing as well with our Sphero ball, and that is running in conjunction um, with the rest of the coding as well. So we, yeah, we have different types of things going on in our code club all at one one time. So as I said earlier, how does assistive technology support our our um, younger students? But before I went into that, I decided to think what is include what is inclusive education. Oh, so inclusive education means all children in the same classroom and the same school are included. So that's all the age groups, all the students with SEN, EAL, all the students, how are they included in that? And it means to give real learning opportunities to groups who are traditionally excluded. And that's one of the things that I try to do in my classroom as well. Usually, uh, well, historically, usually the, when the students are learning, you will usually say, oh, the lower ability students will go to the with the TA and they'll go down down and out of the classroom to do their learning. But I, one of the things I try to foster in my classroom is this inclusive approach, keeping everybody in the classroom. And I really wanted to take that into Code Club as well. Um, and then it's accessibility. So accessibility is given equal access and opportunities to everyone wherever possible as well. So in edu education, this involves reducing and overcoming the barriers that might occur in digital content. So those barriers are the things that I try to break down and I'm looking to break down. I haven't got the answer just yet, but I've got some ideas that might, might well, we can look into in the next year in my co-club. Co um, so what problems do we face in co-club or we may face in co-club? So it's the understanding of instructions. When the instructions are there, we use the Ras Raspberry Pi paths, but those instructions are quite wordy. How do we break down that barrier of um, giving the children understanding of those instructions? I know there's pictorial representations of the code, and that's one of the ways in which we find that um, helps understanding, but also understanding is quite, quite a tricky thing for students who are unable to read the, read the information. Then scaffolding the, the learning and scaffolding how the code is, um, yeah, how the code is seen with the students. So scaffolding is something that I have to do in, in the classroom on a daily basis, but that doesn't happen so often in Code Club. We give the path, we give the instructions and they go away and code, code it. So how can we break down that scaffolding as well? Um, so there's support for SEN, lower ability and EAL students. How can we help those students? the ones that are unable to access that learning at that time. Um, also reading difficulty for younger students. So I've got, I actually have a year one student that has joined us as well, because her sister does it. And she, how do I support her in accessing the learning? And that's one of the questions that I had to face um, this year with my, with my club. Um, and then 
teacher facilitator talk. So if all of these things ha happen, and all of this understanding of instructions, the reading difficulties, if this happens, then usually teacher and facilitator talk time within the club increases because you're having to firefight, having to break down all the instructions for the students. And this, you, as a, as a co-club um, facilitator, want your talk time to be decreased. You want the students to um, take ownership of their learning, take ownership of it, and to... Um, collaborate with others and support each other to complete the code and complete the games. So decreasing the teacher talk time is really, really important in, in my club. And that's something I've worked on as well within my, te my own actual teaching um, as well. So there's a couple of things that we have looked into and we're, we're kind of trialing at the moment. Uh, we've got text to speech, which is a really important tool that we can use. We've got dictation, which is something that I've explored in literacy lessons as well um, and how that's gone into our co-club. Um, screen mask is really important as well. I use screen mask when I'm doing lit uh, reading lessons every single day. If we're reading a text on the computer, I use screen mask and how we can use that in co-club. Um, translator, which is um, um, really important if you've got those EL students and students that are new to the la new to co club, new to language, how can we use the translator function to support those students? Um, another thing is dictionary and picture dictionary. We use um, a, a thing called imprint, which um, in literacy lessons is um, a text, and then it has a picture related to the text. So it's if they're unsure what the, what the word actually means, they've got a dictionary to support them and they've got a picture dictionary to support them. And the picture is one of the most important things. That's how I, that's how I scaffold learners when they're doing their literacy um, work in the classroom. And then split screen is just one of my favorite things that, that I use as well and how I can have two bits of information. So for example, when they are coding, they've got the, um, they've got the code or the instructions on one side of the screen and they've actually got the scratch um, uh, screen on the other on the other side so how we we can maximize um, yeah how we can maximize the learning there so how can we use assistive technology to support our code club so using assistive technology will increase the understanding of the students they'll be able to understand the information that's provided and that will support them with their um, yeah, with their coding. It'll also decrease the need for scaffolding. So you'll be able to take a backward step, you'll be able to, um, and then facilitate the learning, and it'll decrease the adult support needed. It'll give ownership to the students, which is what you want to do. It'll also give access for lower ability students, special educational needs students, and um, new, to, new to English, so EAL students as well or English additional language. And it will also provide reading without the need for an adult, which is the really big key part of what using text-to-speech will support with. Um, and the need to decrease, as I said earlier, the de decrease the teacher and facilitator talk time, which is really important when it comes to, to supporting your co-club. And this then offers a culture of support, so it's con which is conducive to learning. You need support in in your co-club, the students need to support each other to reach the end goal. If there's one thing I do do say is they'll say, oh, they'll put their hand up and say, oh, I don't understand this. Then we'll open the, we'll open the discussion up to our co-club and decide and ask whether that someone within the co-club can support with that. So that's one of the things that is offering a culture of support and creating that is really vital um, to help in your co-club. So here's an example of how we've used, or we're, we're, we've started to use um, accessibility functions or features in our, um, in our co-club. So this is text-to-speech. So this is, um, uh, this is from a company called Text Help, which we, we use in school. And the students are able to highlight the words um, that they are unsure of, the instructions that they're unsure of, and then it'll play it back it'll, to them uh, in, into the headphones. So it'll go from text into speech and then they can understand the text. They can get it to be reread to them. They can decrease the um, speed that the text is being read to them as well. They can change the, um, they can change the person that's talking to them if they want a different uh, accent so that they can understand that. So text-to-speech is really a key way in which we can, um, yeah, give access to, 
to the students, especially with the younger students that are unable to, to read the, the text. That's what we used when it was with the year one student and also year three students use that on a daily basis. I even use it in class uh, constantly. So we, are, we have headphones um, yeah, on standby for, for the, each student. Um, so here's how dictation would work. And this is something we're kind of exploring at the moment. So um, Google Docs has an inbuilt vo voice typing function. And if the students are unable to access the, um, or they're unable to type or access the, for example, spelling is one thing that's usually common, common in class. So using the dictator function, you do voice type in through Google Docs first. You'd use the function click to speak. They would do the voice type in, then they would copy and paste it into the, into the code. Um, into this area here. So it's a, it's a way of using the inbuilt functions within the, um, with, that is accessible for the students. And yeah, moving into voice typing and then into code. And that's one way which you can break down the barrier of spelling or break down some barriers um, to accessing the learning. Another thing is, as I said earlier, screen masking. So that's one thing that we, so usually you would get a ruler if you're reading on a piece, on a piece of paper. We'd the you'd have a ruler which keeps you keeps in line with the text that you're reading. Because usually, when students are reading on a computer, their eyes are actually moving uh, vertically. They're not they're not moving um, horizontally at all times, especially when they're reading reading on a computer. So the screen masking really supports um, supports this um, supports this. They can also change the color of the background as well. So there's one student in year five who um, uses uh, purple as her color for to support with her reading. So you can so the bit in the middle you can you can change the color of that and you can change the color on the outsides to support with um, yeah with the reading uh, with the reading. So this supports reading the text and also one thing I would say is the font is really important as well. So one font that we do all of our presentations in now is called Lexand, which is a font for dys dyslexia. And that's one thing that I've um, brought to the staff um, so that the whole school uses that font, because it's really important that we think about that accessibility for children with dyslexia as well. Um, and that font's a really, really, um, yeah, really good thing. And there was one, one teacher that came to me and was like, wow, that font has really, really helped my learn, helped with my teaching and the way that she um, is able to, to see the text on the screen as well. So that's a really important, important thing. So just thinking about screen masking and thinking about Lex and as well. And this is, as I said before, the company's called Text Help, which we use for our accessibility functions. But there are, for example, dictation is inbuilt and the um, speech to text that's a free, if you get to um, read and write, which I'll show in a moment, you can have that for free as well. So they are, it's not all paid functions. So here's a picture, here's the picture dictionary to support understanding of language. So you've got up here, you've got the normal dictionary. If they're not sure what left is and right is, uh, which is a quite a common mistake, um, they've got then the picture to help them. So if there's left, so you've got dictionary, you've got picture dictionary, and then that'll support their understanding of the language. And this is it in action here. So the student wasn't wasn't sure what the well, I've, he wasn't sure what the word code was, <laughs> so he found it there. So moving on to translation, um, the, here's an important thing. So in the top right hand corner, you've got language here, and most of the most of the uh, programs have been translated already. So if you have students that are new to the to your co-club, for instance, we've got a Portuguese student that's new to our school and he can access the learning in Portuguese. And also you've got um, different, um, different add-ons that you can use in Google. For example, Remember, Remember Berry, uh, Read and Write offers translation as well, and Google Translate. So if you copy and paste the text, into Google Docs and you can translate it through through that as well. So there's different ways in which you can um, give access to students that are new to, to English um, and they, they can uh, have access to Code Club as well. So there's translate functions there too. 
And here's one of my favorites is the split screen function. So as I said, they've got the instructions on the left hand side and then on the right hand side, they're coding the Astro Pi there. So giving them an option to um, have more access to information. And I use that in literacy lessons when we're doing research lessons. They have, for example, the research on the left hand side and then they're taking notes on the right hand side. It's a really simple function um, which can which gives that children access to more information instead of having to change the screen each time. Uh, and this is just one of the, this is the, what we uh, use. So it's a company called Text Help, and this is Read and Write. It's an add-on which you use uh, on Google Chrome. And it's just the little jigsaw in the type. So if you, add, if you um, download it onto your Chrome as an extension, and then the functions by here is speech to text, uh, uh, text to speech, sorry, and then it's there for you. If you wanted the pay, if you wanted all the other um, things as a paid version, but as I said earlier, most of it is inbuilt into the accessibility functions within the Chromebook and within um, Microsoft as well. So this is something that we use and I would recommend using. And this is not just for Code Club, this is for literacy lessons. We use it in history lessons, geography. We use it on a daily basis for accessibility within the classroom as well. Um, and then what does the future hold? I thought this was quite, uh, especially after yesterday's um, keynote speech at the start, I thought this was a really important thing to bring into our, into our um, discussion. So AI, how does AI support with accessibility within the classroom? How can we think about that? So AI can may, well, it can support with understanding. If a student's unsure of an instruction, they can put the instruction into AI and then the AI will be able to give them a clearer answer because one of the inputs where you could say to AI um, into the chat GPT is what age they are. So you, you could say you're a seven year old, um, can you give me the instruction in a, in a more simple way or more simple version for my age and then it will break it down in that, that type of way so it can support with understanding. Another one is a clearer explanation um, of it. So like I said a moment ago, just if you can put the age into it and the prompts that you put into it will give a clear explanation of, of the um, instructions to the students if they're unsure of what something means. Um, something means. Another one is instructional guidance. So breaking instructions down into an accessible, accessible, accessible information. So if the information has been given in, in a, um, if the information has been given in quite a, a difficult way for it, the children to understand, the, the AI is able to put it into tables. The AI is able to break it down into, um, yes, bit, a bit into certain functions. And it's able to break it down for the students. And that's something I'm um, looking into. And the prompts that you give the AI is really important. Um, also, idea generator. So one of the things that, um, one of the things that I think could happen is ideas for games, for example. So, for example, there's the boat race. There's the different paths that they go down. If the students wanted to innovate in any way, then they may be able to ask the chatbot whether they can innovate in a certain, certain way or if it, as the chatbot got ideas. It's not that the students use those ideas, but it's an idea generator. It's an idea generator. This gives them the opportunity to, to, to think and to, to build on that, those ideas. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting, interesting uh, pathway that students can use. Um, as I said, coding is the basis for AI. That's really important. We, the students are at the beginning of their journey, right at the start of their journey. If we can prepare them now, then they'll be the next coders of the future. They'll be the ones that are producing the next um, evolution of chat GPT. So we need to support them and encourage the students to begin their journey as creators for the future of AI technology and use of it. So we're, we're, we're giving them the opportunity to build on, yeah, we're giving them the opportunity to code and to start their journey, which is really important. Um, yeah, really important. I would say any questions, but there's a time, uh, I think it's about 11 o'clock, that you can come and have a discussion about what I've talked about here. Uh, and I just want to leave you on a th final thought. Um, I'm really inspired on a daily basis, really, from my students on a weekly basis with Code Club, um, who are all, always expressing themselves digitally. 
and they know no boundaries. There's always someone innovating in a new way. There's always someone having new ideas. There's always someone on the pushing the boundaries of their code. I just wanted to, to leave you with a final thought really um, on that and to give the students an opportunity. They are the digital, cit digital citizens of tomorrow. We need to prepare them for the, net, for the digital world of tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Uh, if you wanted to, I'm Tech with Rodri on Twitter if you wanted to. Uh, that's my email address if you wanted to get in touch with any thoughts or feelings. Um, I'm happy to, to answer. And thanks everyone.
All right. Can you can you hear me okay? All right. Hello. Uh, and uh, my name is Tim Duffy, and welcome to my talk about the success and approach of my group's Coder Dojo, uh, and how our club has expanded the scope and reach of the Coder Dojo movement. Uh, during this presentation, I will provide a quick intro about myself. Second, I'll go through some bits about our parent organization, the club, and where we are located. Third, we'll get into the important bits about our experience during the pandemic and how we adapted into, into the program we are today. Finally, I'll take you on a tour of the various ideas that we gleaned along the way. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, now, I'm not one to be in the limelight. <clears throat> now you can tell I'm a little shaky right now. So it's a bit weird for me to be up here and have my face up on the big screen like this. Um, however, I and the other club mentors felt it is important to get the word out about how well our club has done. My hope is to provide other clubs here with ideas around what they can do to also succeed. I joined West Sound Technology Association's board as vice president a little over three and a half years ago. Uh, WSTA is the 501c3 nonprofit that founded and operates the club I will be talking to you about today, West Sound Coder Dojo. Uh, for my day job, I work as a senior software developer for, at a company called Thousand Eyes, uh, which was acquired by Cisco Systems back in August of 2020. My job focuses mostly on front-end web development, uh, working on the company's design system. Lastly, my childhood friend and I decided to become business partners uh, last year and purchased a a large uh, 50,000 square foot, 4,600 square meter indoor sports facility we named Bremerton Sports Center after the uh, city that I currently reside in, in the state of Washington in, in the United States. Uh, what might be unique about West Sound Coder Dojo is our club was not founded by and is not run by a library, school organization, or community center. As mentioned previously, West Sound Carter Dojo was founded by the nonprofit WSTA in 2015 by co-champions Donia and Charles Keating. WSTA itself is founded to encourage and promote technological innovation investment into the region west of Seattle. As you'll see in a minute, uh, the commute to and from the tech hub in Seattle isn't as painless as one might think, hence the encouragement of technological investment in our area. West Sound Coder Dojo has moved around the county. It started in over its history, but has landed at a public library. For most of the year, we typically hold bi-weekly uh, two-hour club meetings. Uh, we stop for the summer. Uh, uh, we stop for the summer break while public schools are closed and families are vacationing. In 2016, we decided to slightly change the focus of our club to allow adults to individually participate participate in the activities during the meetings we hold. Uh, this focus shift has not only grown our attendee numbers, but has also helped to recruit adult mentors. Uh, but we did not stop there though. The younger attendees we found to be strong coders, we encouraged them to mentor as well. This has included Donia and Charles' daughter, Meryl, uh, pictured up there in the middle of the screen, who, you, who started mentoring when she was 10 years old. We feel having youth mentors uh, helps, uh, helps to hone leadership skills sorely needed in the world today and encourages intergenerational collaboration and involvement for all in our club. As I mentioned before, it is not as easy as one might expect commuting to and from uh, Seattle from where we currently hold our club events on the Kitsap Peninsula in the city of Silverdale. It's right there. Uh, if you were able to fly straight across, it's just under 20 miles, 32 kilometers from Seattle. However, the reality is, as shown on the screen, the travel infrastructure in the area without traffic, you will be spending an hour to an hour and a half each way in a car, longer if it's rush hour. This is one of the many reasons why WST formed in the first place. Uh, we saw the need for talented future coders in the region, which is why we also formed our club. We're constantly looking for other advocates of future generation coders in our area. So to best serve these advocates, we decided to become a Coder Dojo licensed regional group to help other clubs get their start in our area. As it turns out, 
We are one of only two licensed regional groups in the entirety of the United States. As volunteer club event organizers, it is not always easy to produce topics or content for meetings and events. Partnering with local and or national organizations whose values and interests align is a great way to produce individual event content. By partnering with some of the original, some of the organizations you see on the screen, <clears throat> we were able to produce events like coding workshops, an AI mini conference, and an invid individually organized TEDx event. We made sure to celebrate annual global and national events with our own club events for things like Raspberry Jam, Scratch Day, and Hour of Code. The annual Hour of Code event is a national event organized by Code.org. Code.org is an education innovation non-producing coding related curriculum for schools in the United States. The purpose of the Hour of event is to encourage a one hour coding session in STEM related school classes nationwide. To get the word out about our club, we made sure to either have a booth or make an appearance at various regional STEM showcases for example, uh, we set up a booth for a showcase in a local shopping mall with a bunch of laptops with scratch pulled up. We then had the browsing public come up and start coding, briefly showing them the ropes along the way. Uh, as, excuse me. As I'm sure many of you here can relate, the pandemic made it quite difficult for clubs to continue operating. Unfortunately, some clubs around the world shut down their operations. Our region was not spared either. Out of a handful of clubs that operated in our region, we ended up being the only club that continued and stayed operating throughout the pandemic. To this day, we are still the only Coder Dojo club operating in our region. To stay safe during the pandemic, our club shifted to a virtual only, uh, virtual only mentor led model. This meant group Zoom video calls with ninjas. At first, uh, logistically, we found operating this way to be quite difficult. Sorry, hold on. Okay. Uh, but it, as, excuse me, this meant that, okay. but as many of you have found for yourself, keeping a collaborative conversation productive, cohesive, and coherent in a virtual room full of youngsters is just not quite feasible. So to make sure we could lead a productive club meeting for our ninjas, we had our mentors lead the conversation instead. Mentors leading each comedian's conversation were tasked with selecting at least one coding project that could fill the meeting time, sourced from many online resources. Then the mentor would present the solution uh, for the project to the ninjas by sharing their screen and talking the ninjas through the solution step by step. While we did not require it, we encouraged the ninjas to follow along on their own computers, solving the same project. The ninjas also had the option to use the meeting time to, their, to do their own work, uh, their own coding projects. If individual ninjas required extra help, our club did our best to have at least one additional mentor on the call. That additional mentor would hop into a virtual breakout room in the same Zoom session with the ninja to help. We also provided time, usually towards the end of the meeting, to allow ninjas to present their other projects that they had been working on either during the meeting or outside of Coder Dojo. Well, nothing really uh, can replace an in-person experience. The virtual model did allow our club to survive. We were able to continue to collaborate, engage with, and, and have fun with our ninjas while staying relevant for when we went back to in-person meetings. Coming out of the pandemic, we were determined to continue to encourage collaboration and youth mentoring. We moved to a new location, more centrally located in our county, and resumed in-person club meetings in September of last year. We found that encouraging ninjas to demo the projects they are working on has a knock-on effect on collaboration. 
ninjas viewing the other ninjas demos who see something they'd like to try themselves are encouraged to approach the ninja ninja presenter after the presentation to ask questions and gain insights into their project this then turns the presenter into a mentor and often the two ninjas collaborate for the remainder of the meeting continuing to keep our club open to all ages aids in this collaboration effort providing more opportunities for ninjas to see what else is possible from people with different and diverse backgrounds. During our meetings, we point ninjas to various online resources, including edX and Coursera. And for those who want a little tougher challenge than Scratch or other block coding platforms would use those platforms. Our club has also invest, invested in physical books creating a small library of self-starter projects and tutorials, including a couple Coder Dojo Nano books. All of this learning makes the ninjas hungry, not only for coding, but also food. To satisfy their appetites, we make sure to provide at least one option for snacks. This is one of the best decisions we have made for ninja retainment during our meetings. If you feed them snacks, ninjas will stay in the meeting for longer, go figure. We highly recommend other clubs do the same if this is permissible given your meeting location and if you have the means to do so. As I conclude my presentation, uh, let's review some ideas uh, you might want to take with you to improve your own club ninja experience. <clears throat> In our opinion, dojos are meant to be dynamic with the many ways to learn how to code in solving coding related problems. Keep an open mind when it comes to the scope of your dojo. We have had ninjas bring in everything from hardware projects to robotics to 3D printers. We have also partnered with local and regional organizations to have them provide coding and hardware and learning materials. We have partnered with some of these same organizations to put on mini conferences covering a wide variety of STEM topics. By doing all of this, it has allowed us to appeal to a wide variety of age and gender groups and it can for you too. Central, centrally, uh, centralized physical and online learning resources are great as well. It's a great idea to create a small physical book library of your own to never run out of diverse learning and resources for your ninjas to try. And of course, food. If your club has the means, it's a great way to keep ninjas retained and engaged. In closing, I would like to thank my club's co-champions, Donya and Charles Keating for creating our club and uh, their continued personal support of me. I would also like to thank the Raspberry Pi Foundation for putting on this conference and welcoming me to speak to you all today. And of course, thank you all for attending. Cheers and be cool.
Okay, I'm going to get started if that's okay. Um, but yeah, hi everyone. My name is Sophie Hudson. I'm a Key Stage 2 primary school teacher in North Yorkshire. Um, very rural school. We've only got 65 children at the moment. So um, just to give you a little bit of context into what we've done, um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit today about how we've used AstroPi within Code Club, but actually within our curriculum as well, um, and the impact that's had on the children um, and also the impact it's had on Code Club and how I felt about kind of leading Code Club having done the AstroPi project. Um, um, just so you kind of know a bit about me, um, about five years ago, I was told that I was going to be the new computing lead. That tends to happen in primary schools. I'm actually lead for three different subjects at my school because we don't have very many staff members. And I was no expert at all. I was up for it, but yeah, fine, I'll give it a go. Um, but yeah, I was a little bit clueless. And so um, for me, the Code Club aspect of it has been something that's really boosted my confidence and um, kind of really helped me engage the learners, um, not just with um, Code Club, but also with the curriculum teaching as well. Um, I attempted Code Club to start it during the, uh, the pandemic, which was a little bit bonkers, but actually um, it really did engage the children and gave them something different to do while they were um, learning at home. And um, then when we got back to school, um, there were quite a few of them, but I will say the Astro Pi project that we did as a whole school approach, as a whole key stage two approach, probably enthused them to join Code Club a little bit more um, once we'd actually completed that project. Um, so yeah, we're just going to talk about how I did it really as a, a curriculum thing, but also how I managed 45 children this year doing code, uh, the AstroPi project all at the same time, um, how we foster that kind of uh, respect for each other and teamwork within the, the project, how it links across the curriculum to other areas of learning, and also um, what I've seen, because I, I did it two weeks ago, what I've seen since then in my Code Clubbers um, and the participation that has also sort of slightly changed within Code Club. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what this is all about. Um, first of all, I wasn't really sure about using AstroPi to start with. I was a little bit intimidated. It's not really um, something I felt confident with to start with, but I really did think actually there's something here that I can use as a project day to enthuse the class um, and it includes all of this sort of stuff about the curriculum. There's elements of art, geography, science, obviously the social skills involved in doing this as a team approach and the computing curriculum there, introducing them to problem solving, starting off uh, a bit of a, a text-based coding journey for some of them who might only have ever had Scratch before. Um, plus the really lovely thing about this, the first year we did it, we also managed to get Key Stage 1 involved, the really younger children, because we were typing a little message on the Astro Pi um, and they were learning about space. So for them, they chose what their message was going to be and we coded it for them. Um, so it was real. It was real for the entire school, um, not just something that, you know, yeah, it's a lovely game that we can share. It was something that was actually going to be used in a real life context. Um, so that's sort of why we, we did that. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll take you on our, our this year's AstroPi sort of journey, I suppose. Um, but it is a really, really great tool to use across the curriculum. And it's something that um, certain skills, so I've got children who are so into geography, maybe not so much into coding, um, but it really kind of gave them something that they were good at and they could understand what was, what was going on. And it gave them a hook into the project. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> okay, so. 40 children, 45 it was actually this year. Um, how on earth did I manage it? <laughs> we don't have a huge amount of resources in our school. We have got um, some lots and lots of iPads and we've got some desktop computers. I think I've got a total of six laptops that work at the moment. I mean, this is just what it's like sometimes in these smaller schools. So we had to really think about how we were going to make this manageable. Um, it was all of Key Stage 2 involved and only three adults. Um, we spread ourselves across two rooms, but as you can see, you know, we really did need to think carefully about how we could make this a bit more pupil-led and how we could ensure that the, the children were supporting each other, understanding it. And so the year sixes, the older ones who are about 11, could support sort of the seven-year-olds for whom this is a really big kind of mind-boggling thing. And they really needed to, that support. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of roughly what was we were doing and it was very carefully thought out very carefully mapped out i turned it into a full day project because for us we were trying to ce celebrate british science week um which was week before the one finished 
tricky when we had strikes going on and other things that we had to contend with. Um, but for me, this really does encompass kind of science, computing, molding a few things together. Um, and it was a really fantastic project to do within that week. So first of all, we looked at geography. Um, we really thought very carefully about, right, okay, this is a teamwork thing that we're all going to be focused on. They were put into teams, so younger children with older children, and very, very sort of thought out in terms of, like, let's face it, which personalities are really going to get on with each other. Um, and their first job was to do a bit of research um, using atlases and online things to try and work out all the different countries that were involved in the ISS. For some of these children, they don't really know what the ISS is. So we gave them the background into it. We watched some Tim Peake videos. We talked to them about the ISS as a, a big sort of science research project that is all based on teamwork because without all these countries taking part in this, it wouldn't ever have happened. Um, so we looked at maps, we looked at where the countries are, um, they kind of found them on their maps and we did a little bit of like noticing things, quite a lot of the countries were all in the Northern Hemisphere, quite a lot of really good conversation about the map work that they were doing. Um, and also quite a lot of the children, whenever you say science and space and things, they instantly go NASA. That's the only thing they kind of associate with it. And I think that's probably from films and stuff, you know, the popular culture. Um, it was interesting that they didn't know very much about the European Space Agency. So it was really good to have that discussion at the beginning of the day about what is this thing? Why is it important and who's involved? Um, and they were, they were pretty fascinated and they, they love all the map work anyway. So using these little maps to try and work out, right, where is that country? And, uh, and why, you know, why does this work? Well, it works because of teamwork. And that was a really big message for us. So geography was first. Um, after geography, we moved into an art curriculum, which was also kind of based on the, the coding as well. Um, so the AstroPi project this year, as I'm sure some of you already know, was all about um, nature images and putting those onto the AstroPi. Um, we kind of discussed what it would be like up on the space station. Um, and a lot of the children said they probably thought it would be a bit lonely. And we were saying, right, well, this is kind of just a bit of well-being for these astronauts who are up there. They can have a little bit of a memory of a picture from home, um, and they know that the children have coded this. It's quite heartwarming for them to see these images, that sort of thing. Um, now, we don't like to do things by halves at our school. It was going to be very easy to kind of borrow the, the pictures that were already on the AstroPi project. Um, but we decided to stretch it a bit and make it more of their own project. So they were introduced to pixels, what pixels are. Um, we thought very carefully about um, a bit of maths involved here. It's a 64, eight by eight. Um, and then we explained that, you know, bigger, better screens will have smaller pixels. And then, you know, this is all quite blocky, but we can still turn it into a picture. They were given a bit of time to experiment with this um, because it's quite hard actually drawing a, drawing a nature themed picture. It was good to have those images from the Astro Pi mission and we printed them so they could see some examples and they could use those examples if they wanted to. Um, and once we did that, we um, started to think about color and how they were going to make the colors they want in their pictures using code. Um, and you can see See, we've got we've got this lovely um, thing up here, the, the writing up here. One girl in particular, I think she might be in the next Farrow and Bull paint namer, to be honest. She loved describing all these different colours and then telling us what the RGB numbers were. This is something that a lot of them had never really come across before and they were absolutely fascinated. They loved playing on the RGB calculator, which was part of the AstroPi project and having a really good idea of um, how they could make it more kind of orangey or more green. And we gave them those little challenges. Um, I didn't think they would work it out as quickly as they did, but instantly they could make black and white um, and realised it was you know, all of it or none of it. And, um, and they had that quite clear idea. Um, but they, they loved this. And it was great to be able to talk to them about which colours will maybe show up better, how they could make their background stand out, because we also spoke at this point about how the background would be changing colour. So they needed to make it so that the picture would stand out. Um, these two pictures on the board, you can see the top one was actually completed by a year three child. I hope you can tell it's a lion. Um, and obviously the, the flower at the bottom. 
and they absolutely adored it. Um, and yeah, it was a really nice thing to do. Uh, once we did that, we actually needed to sort of start talking about coding. Now, um, in order to prepare for this, I completed the project myself. And I think that's really, really important because if you don't do it yourself, you can't quite work out all those little bits that might go wrong and where the children are going to struggle. Um, I actually screenshotted each section <laughs> for myself as well so that I could look back if any of them are having any problems and we could work it out together looking at my code that I had already done. Um, the instructions of course are, are there for you to follow but I did find having them printed they could really carefully read the code and see oh hang on I've, I've not put this bit in or it's in the wrong place and they could sort of debug it themselves. Um, some nice quotes here from the children and it was quite nice as well that a few of them have got quite a lot of experience with Scratch. Um, some of the older children been to code club quite a lot um, and they were able to kind of link some of this new python language that they don't know as well to the scratch and, and i think that middle quote the i in range part is like a loop like in scratch they were able to kind of make those links with things that they do know with something that is quite new to them um, we were very clear with the children there were either three of them in a group or there were a couple of groups of four um, and we had this, this discussion about how they could organize themselves and also organize their time so that they were able to be successful. Um, and um, they decided themselves how to do that, but with our kind of guidance. So we had roles for each other. I was the reader. We took it in turns with the coding so that we could all feel a part of it. Um, yeah, they really did think carefully about, well, I'm an older child, so I can, I can do these things well. And they were very, very supportive of the, the younger learners who, you know, for, for them, this is, this is incredibly new and possibly a bit mind boggling, but they, they are getting the gist of it from the support of the older children. Um, what was really lovely was um, the success. Every team that we did put together managed to code this, code it pretty well themselves. I did take a bit of a step back and, you know, we taught them through it and gave them the guidance, but they were pretty able to do this as a group on their own. Um, this is a year three child, this is a year six child, and together they really, really did sort of um, talk about it, work out where they'd gone wrong. Um, um, it was it was quite rare that they came to me and said I need help because they had enough people around them to support them and help each other. Um, a couple of quotes there for you to read just to show the kind of impact that this has had. Um, the teamwork aspect was helpful. I have a feeling if even the year sixes, if I'd given them a laptop each and said, right, you're going to do this and you're all going to do it on your own. I'm fairly confident I would have had to have stepped in a lot more than I did, even with 45 children, year three to year six, working in these small kind of team groups. Um, and I think that that was quite, you know, for them, knowing that they had responsibility in their team, knowing that, yes, I'm an older child, I'm going to step up, I've got experience of Code Club or whatever else they've done in the curriculum because they've worked with micro bits and some other things as well. They've got a bit more experience than the, the year threes will have. And I think that really helped them step up and, and engage and listen, make sure they knew what they needed to do because they were responsible for their team being able to be successful. Um, so yeah, we've got the, the, the ones here as well. Um, what's been really lovely um, about this um, is that because of the year threes having access, um, it has kind of generated a little bit more buzz about our code club. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you about next. Um, the AstroPi project, I think, is a really, really good tool to engage children because it is real and it is something that they're you know, quite passionate and excited about. Um, but our code club has um, sort of really kind of changed. It's evolved since we've started using AstroPi with the children who aren't necessarily even in code club. Um, our code club at my school has been running for quite a, a few years now. Um, and it's, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, it's a bit more of an informal code club. Um, it's on a Friday lunchtime at the moment. And um, it's more of a drop in. I don't want the children to feel like they have to come every single week, but they love being able to drop in when they want to do some coding. We're all there to support each other in our coding community. Um, and what really has happened is that um, children who 
potentially before wouldn't have really necessarily shown much interest, have become more interested in joining our code club. Um, there's a, a boy on the screen, the blonde boy, you can't see his face, I'm sorry. But um, he, in particular, two years ago, when we first started doing the Astro Pi project, was having a lot of confidence problems. Um, he uh, really kind of was struggling just with self-esteem issues, um, really finding it hard to engage even at school. Um, we did Astro Pi. He was only year three at that point, and um, he was in a team with two other children. They supported him, and actually, he really picked it up quite quickly. Um, he came along to Code Club, and from that, he became one of our key coders. He's one of our leaders. We call them experts at our Code Club. He's one of the experts that takes part in the um, in that. And um, I think because of the Astro Pi project, he did it. He found it hard, but he achieved. He then came to Code Club. He found that tricky to start with, but he achieved. He is now um, in year five, and he is an incredibly confident young man. He's doing incredibly well at school, and I think it's just had a massive knock-on for his particular self-esteem. Now, he's not alone in this. There's quite a few other children who have really benefited from this kind of route into our Code Club, I suppose. Um, and it really has helped us foster a bit of a sense of community. Being part of these groups doing Astro Pi has meant that the younger children have got to know the older children a bit better. They've learned from them. They've got kind of that idea that they are there to help them as well. They're not just big, scary year sixes. They're there to be supportive. And this kind of um, community of coders is something that I think is really important and something that I've really tried to foster within our code club at school. Um, we move on to the next one. Um, what next for us? Well, as I said, I only finished the Astro Pi project this year, a couple of weeks ago, um, and um, it is now a valued part of our curriculum. It is something we will be doing every single year. It is something that um, the children really benefit from. Probably do it slightly differently next year, so we won't be finding the, the countries that are involved in the ISS, but I do think that conversation about teamwork and what teamwork can achieve really hits home with this project. Um, so it's part of our computing curriculum now. It's just an integral part of what they do um, within British Science Week. Um, we're going to obviously continue our code club, but what has been really lovely, and I, I say this, you know, I've only done it a couple of weeks ago. We've done two code club sessions since. Um, year threes and fours in code club are coming up to me and they want to start Python projects. And that wasn't happening before. They were so confident with Scratch. They were so excited about using the block coding language. Um, and I tried to sort of talk to them about Python and, you know, the HTML ones before, but they just weren't really showing that much interest. And so we carried on with Scratch because that's what they were interested in, the younger ones. Um, they've all come up to me and said, I want to start Python. And that's maybe six of them, considering we only have 45 in Key Stage 2, um, six of them from Code Club coming up saying, after Astro Pi, I want to do real coding. I want to do written coding. Um, and we've started some of those Python projects through Code Club. So things like the um, we've been making Easter cards using the, um, the HTML one. Um, and uh, my next step really with my Code Club, based on all of this, is more Python. And that probably means me building up my confidence with that even more. But it's exciting. And I think the children really have benefited from a whole school breaking it into those separate little individual kind of subject areas, making it manageable by working in teams, and then it's infused them to work, not just with Scratch, but with other sort of languages of code and show much more interest in that. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, presentation. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I would recommend it if you can give it a go with a bigger group and you can kind of generate that, that community uh, approach then um, I think it has a lot of positives and I would really say that it's something to, to try anyway. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
There we go. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> um, I think we're going to get started, and then as people drift in, they can come and join us. Um, we are also on the live stream today, so hello to everyone who is joining us on the live stream. Watch back on the live stream. It's nice to have you. Um, my name is Helen. I've talked to a lot of you in our corridor in the stand. Um, <clears throat> but I'm talking to you today about KUDS projects, and I'm the KUDS projects program manager at the Rashby Pi Foundation. So before we get started, who has participated in any kind of KUDS projects event before? Wave at me. Good number of waving. Um, fantastic. Um, today we're going to run through what is KUDS projects, how can it work for you, how to enter, all the basics. So by the end of the session, you should be ready to go with entering your own KUDS projects from your young people. Um, and I'm going to have some extra help from a previous KUDS projects volunteer who's participated to tell you all about what the experience is like. Um, so let's get started with what is Coolest Projects itself. If you haven't heard of it before, um, Coolest Projects is an incredible celebration of young people and all the amazing things they make with code. Um, it's for anyone up to the age of 18, um, and we've got events and showcases that run for young people anywhere in the world. Um, so whatever you're doing, it can be a Coolest Project. Um, and Coolest Projects, the aim of it is to really just encourage young people, inspire them to keep creating and to feel rewarded and acknowledged for the things that they create already. So a bit about the background to Coolest Projects. Um, the first Coolest Projects event um, was started by Coda Dojo in Ireland back in 2012. Do we have any Irish Coda Dojo volunteers? Yes, Sonia. Um, so some incredible volunteers in Ireland um, put together the first Coolest Projects. Um, and since then, it's grown and developed. And it's now a whole series of events that run around the world for young people. Um, since the pandemic, Coolest Projects has moved online. And we now have a big online showcase that's open every year. Last year, we had uh, 2,500 young people participate from 46 countries. And so this is 2016 event when we were back in person. So the basics, all Coolest Projects events and showcases work the same. So young people submit their projects um, and those projects get personalized feedback, they get rewards, um, and the main thing is that they get to share their projects with others, supporters, peers, mentors, colleagues, parents, so that they can really show other people what they're doing and see projects from other creators to get inspired so that they're feeling like part of a community um, and that they know that there are other young people out there creating great things with code. Um, you can enter projects in six categories that we've got there. There will be a category that fits what you're doing. If it's got code in it, if it's a digital project, there's a space for it in Coolest Projects. Um, young people can enter individually or in teams of up to five. Um, and I think a really important thing is that all digital projects are welcome from beginner to advanced, anything in between. We see some incredible IoT, surveillance, cars, physical computing, flamethrowing party poppers, the works. And we also get a lot of first scratch projects um, that young people are really proud of, the basics. So there's a kind of whole range and all of it's welcome. Um, and coolest projects don't have to be finished to be submitted. So if you're working on something that's a work in progress, coolest projects is a great place to put that. Um, coolest project is always free <laughs> um, and we have some events that run in person um, and we have some events that run online um, and we've got this year what's happening is we're going to have our online showcase so this started in the pandemic and has kept going because it's been really a, a really big success at expanding the reach getting people all over the world to participate um, and I'll put the dates on screen and remind them of you a lot <laughs> but it, registration is open now for coolest projects online till the 26th of april and it's a big celebration for young creators anywhere in the world and also the thing that i'm very excited about is we are back for our first in-person coolest projects event since the pandemic we're in ireland so it's a coolest projects event for young creators in northern ireland and the republic of ireland and that's going to be on the first of july in dublin and then what you might see is also some Coolest Projects national events run by some of our partners. So we have Coolest Projects Belgium, 
Yes, in the middle, representing from Coolest Projects Belgium, which is happening in April. Um, we have Coolest Projects in Hungary. We've got um, South Africa, Malaysia. We're bringing in some new Coolest Projects this year. So you'll probably see other Coolest Projects national events run all over the world, um, some of which are online and in person. So there's some great opportunities to participate there as well. Um, so what's up next? The dates. Oh, they've gone all over the place. But registration is open, basically, for both our events. That's the key message. So for Coolest Projects Online, um, registration closes on the 26th of April. Um, and for Coolest Projects Ireland, just down at the bottom, registration closes on the 31st of May, and our event day is the 1st of July. Um, Coolest Projects, um, if you are participating in an in-person event, for example, in Ireland or in Belgium, you might also want to submit to Coolest Projects Online. You can submit projects to both. It's a great opportunity for young people to show what they've made in many different areas. So that's all there. Um, and this is my big pitch. The young people participating love Coolest Projects. So they've told us um, that the cool things about Coolest Projects Online last year were that a lot of people around the world get to see your projects, that anyone have a, can have a go, and that you get personalized feedback, which is really important. Um, and just down at the bottom, my stats to back it up. So 94% of people who participated in Coolest Projects Online last year told us that it made them more interested in programming and computing. So it's a really encouraging way of getting involved. So again, when I've been talking to a lot of people on the stand, I think the important thing about Coolest Projects is you can make something unique to Coolest Projects. It's a great focus for young people to create something that they care about and have somewhere for it to go so a nice endpoint that's really clear but you can also enter what you're you've already made and are proud of that's really welcome in coolest projects um you can register a project if it isn't finished <laughs> so work in progress ideas if it's code and it's digital and it's a project it's a coolest project um and registration is Pretty simple. Um, I've done it with people at the end of a session. So if they've made, for example, a Scratch project in a session, it's completed, it's halfway there, they're proud of it. It can be a coolest project. There's a quick form for the online event to fill in um, with either a Scratch link or a one, two minute video of a project and um, answering a couple of questions about what they love about their projects um, and why they made it. And that's the submission. So all of our projects, are, it's kind of quick and easy to register. Um, and projects are welcome at all levels. So whatever you're making, it's a coolest project. There's some good opportunities to register this year for online and in-person events. Um, and I'll have a whole slide at the end that's just like, here's what you need to do. So that's the one to take a photo of. Um, I've talked a lot about what Coolest Projects is. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Paul <laughs> for a code of doing tomorrow to tell you about what it's like to participate in Coolest Projects and his experience. Hi, um, so my name is Paul McCartan. I'm a champion at the Coder Dojo Tremor. Um, Tremor is a seaside resort on the southeast of uh, Ireland, about 11,000 uh, po uh, population town. And we love Coolest Projects. We've been a number of years. Um, I just picked a few photos to try and show how much we love it. So um, uh, we, were, we have been spoiled rotten in that uh, 2018 and 2019, the international event was held in Dublin in the RDS Convention Center. So um, that was handy enough for us to travel. And um, that first photo is uh, our, our bus up to Dublin. Um, I'm not sure who's more excited, the mentors or the ninjas, a bit of both, I think. Um, so those events in the convention center were just like a young person's tech nirvana. Um, just even besides presenting your projects, there was um, lock rooms and puzzle games and drone flying. And uh, they had the presenters doing um, pretend pitch interviews with the kids and asking them for how much seed money did they want and writing ginormous uh, novelty checks for them. And we, we love that, we love that. Um, so for us, uh, entering a Coolest Project is uh, what comes next. So the, um, your ninjas have done all the project resources and uh, they've eaten it all up and they don't know what to do with it with all this programming power they have, what comes next? So this is a way to channel them into a, a, a slightly bigger challenge. Um, so what, what we found out, so we always recommend and do a little presentation on Coolest Projects uh, in our club every year. 
and, and try to encourage our, our guys to take part. Um, what we do find is that the prospect of a multi-week project, um, multi-month possible project, can be daunting um, for a lot of the ninjas. So um, I th we've found that um, if they can get a, a, a true connection to the subject they pick on um, uh, uh, and they can connect with it, it really helps a lot. So um, those last two on the end are my daughters, um, Amy and Grace, and that's from the Coolest Projects uh, International Event in Dublin in 2019. And in between them is the project that they worked on together as a team. Uh, Grace was the coder, Amy was the, uh, she says, we call her a tester, she tried to break everything that they, they <laughs> built. Um, and uh, um, what they worked on was, Grace was, uh, at the time, she was doing some lectures for kids uh, on a, a chemistry, basic chemistry uh, that she'd been admitted to. And she was fascinated with the periodic table. So what we hit on for her project was um, to, in Scratch, make an interactive uh, periodic table uh, that you could click on the elements. And when you went into the element, you got a little Bohr diagram with the nucleus and the right number of electrons flying around. And you got you got some trivia about the element and its use in the real world. And there was a quiz at the end. And just that really connected with Grace. She, she, she loved that project. And, uh, and um, they, um, when the judges came, I stepped back and they made their pitch and excitedly talked about their project. And she, we didn't expect this, but two hours later, they were invited up to stage for to win an award in the visual programming category. I think we all were shocked, and it was <laughs> just it was fantastic. So that's face to face. I know international now uh, with the pandemic and online has become a thing. We're still coming to terms with that, but I think we'll recommend it to our guys as well. I, I know the online allows so many more people to, to participate. Yeah, uh, people who can't travel, and the number of entrants is starting to enter into the thousands, isn't it? So um, uh, definitely um, the fun and participating, the fun of participating uh, and presenting to the judges um, is definitely part of the whole experience uh, we found. Um, and, uh, but I would say project feedback is essential. So um, I know when I've heard that when you submit an international, you uh, make your pitch video, that's important. But I'd be interested to know after this, uh, how you get your feedback or does everybody, does everybody hear back in their projects? So, but, um, so we love Coolest Projects and uh, we're definitely gonna keep uh, submitting entries. And uh, yeah, thanks very much, Helen, for inviting me to talk about my experience. All the great things about Coolest Projects better than I could have said them. And thank you also for raising the feedback point. <laughs> um, so feedback is a really important part of participating in Coolest Projects. Um, and at in-person events, there are judges present to give young people detailed feedback, talk them through their project. Um, for our online event, um, the online showcase, every participant gets personalized feedback on their project from two judges. And in order to do this with kind of 1800 projects, um, we bring in um, some of our fantastic corporate partners and sponsors who are our shortlisters. So from organizations like um, Allianz Technology, from Meta previously, from kind of all over, and they review and shortlist every single project twice and give some really targeted feedback to the young people on how their project works, which it's fantastic for them. It's the favorite thing to offer people to do is to get involved reviewing all these fun projects. And it makes a real difference to the young people seeing that there's dedicated feedback on their projects. Um, so that's a fantastic element of it. Oh, we've lost it. My presentation's come back. There we go. So that's my AV talking about it. Oh, well, enjoy the clubs conference background <laughs> while I talk to you more about those projects. No, it's still not. Oh. We're picking it up. Showcase gallery. Ta -da. So the showcase gallery is something you can have a look at for the um, to get an idea of coolest projects and what's online at the moment. Our 2023 showcase gallery has already opened. We've got some fantastic stuff in there already for you to have a look at. And I'd really recommend finding the coolest project showcase gallery. Um, 2022 is online, 2023 is online, and you can go through and have a play with the projects and see what's up there. Highly recommended. We also have some mentor resources. So if you're planning on running Coolest Projects 
in your club or your dojo, um, there's some great stuff to help you out with it. We've got um, a young person's workbook that takes them through the stages from sort of design, ideation, testing, debugging, creating their project, which is a really useful resource. There's a linked mentor workbook for you to work through that with them. Um, and we've got some session plans and slide decks that you can just take and run with. So there's a whole lot of resources on closeprojects.org to help you run sessions. Um, and then just to finish, register your project. So I'd definitely recommend having a go at Coolest Projects. Registration is open for the online showcase until the 26th of April. Coolest Projects Ireland is open until the 31st of May. Um, and when you're registering for the Ireland event, um, for those in Ireland and Northern Ireland, we've got some partial bursaries available so you can apply for costs to support your travel um, to get to the event and support you to attend. There is a whole bunch of information, FAQs, more than you could ever need on the coolestprojects.org website. Um, our registration page is the take part one there, so this is the one to take a picture of. Um, we are on Twitter, and there's a hello at coolestprojects.org email address if you have any more questions after the session that comes straight to me and I will pick them up with you. Um, I am around all day. I know we're heading to lunch now, so this is the end of our kind of quick session today. Um, but I am about, please do come and ask me questions. I think I have like three stickers left, so they're all yours. I'll get them out. Um, and I've got some leaflets and some more so I can chat through with you how Coolest Projects works and answer any questions. But it's been lovely to have an opportunity to talk to you today. And thank you and thank Paul, most of all. <laughs> Thanks very much.
Okay, thank you very much. I think we're cooking with gas. Uh, thanks everyone for um, bothering to turn up to my session. <laughs> and hello to everybody at home uh, who's watching on the live stream, uh, wherever you are, yeah, even if you're sitting on the toilet, because fair play, we've all done it. Don't. <laughs> So uh, before I start talking about um, blowing raspberries or speaking in tongues, uh, I'd like to think that my journey to where I am, uh, where I got to today is important. Um, others mightn't think so, but either way, I've got 20 minutes to fill. So uh, first of all, I'm Welsh. I was sent to Welsh primary school and my entire education has been through the medium of Welsh. And my wife and I have brought up our three daughters uh, with Welsh as their first language. So that's park that. That's my Welshness. And then next is my ITness. So uh, hands up who remembers the pet? Everybody with grey hair. Good. <laughs> uh, while I was in secondary school a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I saw one of these Commodore pets on demo at a stall at an Eisteddfod. Hands up, who knows what an Eisteddfod is? Well done. Yes, good. Eisteddfod is a celebration of Welsh language culture with poetry and music competitions and loads and loads of stalls. And one university was demonstrating, let's, yeah, ooh, lasers work, was demonstrating the Commodore playing a simple game, but I was hooked. So, uh, based on the US uh, Tandy TRS-80, the Dragon 32 uh, burst into existence in Wales for the European market. So uh, I fell in love with it, nagged my parents into getting me one and started my personal computing journey. Uh, I played games, wrote music on it, programmed databases. I even coded the whole of Tabach, Sakata and Fugue in D minor on it. And once I'd worked out where in its princely array of 32K of memory, uh, once I found out where the programs that I'd written were located, I wrote some self-modifying code for it. Uh, then uh, I got myself in a, a Commodore Amiga 500 with my, that was my introduction into real computing systems, fabulous games, great sound, and I got introduced to such scary concepts as LS and CD and change directory and stuff like that. So then came a, a degree in computer science at Aberystwyth, uh, where we mucked around with uh, Honeywell Bull 60, L66 mainframes. Uh, I then got my first job as an analyst programmer in British Steel. And then came my big break at British Steel. I became a systems programmer, which is just like a systems administrator. Uh, I could now say no with authority to anybody. Uh, new paths of, uh, of knowledge and megalomania, hitherto unforeseen, uh, were mine to conquer. Then, after a big stint, after a stint in the big smoke, uh, I came back to South Wales and got a job as a data, database administrator for Lloyds Bank and there they had a program called Digital Champions where those who identified themselves as being able to know one end of a mouse mat from another they were encouraged to uh, bridge the digital divide and volunteer their time and services. So my first attempt at being a digital champion was to help uh, a little old lady, an elderly music teacher who was happened to be my wife's music teacher when she was in school uh, because she couldn't log on to her email. So I thought, ah, oh, this is going to be a cinch. Turned up, when I, found, when I turned up, I found out that she had a powerful PC, laptops, tablets. She knew Windows and iOS like a boss. And I was like, okay, this wasn't what I was expecting. But one of the opportunities of the scheme whee, was to help out with something called Code Club. And it was at this time that my daughter's uh, year four teacher, she had started a code club in her school for years, year four and upwards. So in order to help out, uh, I became a STEM ambassador, got my DBS check and signed up to help. Um, 
around about this time, I bought my first Raspberry Pi. Uh, I had no idea what to do with it. Uh, I then got another Raspberry Pi. I won it in a, um, a mainframe conference, and somebody had put a mainframe emulator on a Raspberry Pi. So there was this Raspberry Pi running a 1964-year oper uh, operating system, and it was like, whoa! Uh, and that was it then, so many more Raspberry Pis and other iterations later, uh, I eventually had a Raspberry Pi birthday cake for my 50th birthday. Uh, which was like last week, <laughs> I wish. So obviously, the code club that we ran in a Welsh school was in Welsh. Uh, club Cordia is Welsh for code club. And we were a bit of a hit, apparently, because uh, uh, that's Sarah there. No, it's not. It's uh, Sarah's predecessor, Adam. Uh, Adam was the Welsh coordinator for code club, and he got Maria, who was the director at the time, to come along and pay us a visit. One thing I did notice was that girls made up around 50% of the attendees of our code club. And after that, my uh, raspberry snowballs, my volunteering snowballed. Uh, I helped run Internet Safer Days, or Safer Internet Days, uh, got myself Raspberry Pi certified education. We went to family jams. Um, we went to the Raspberry Pi birthday jam. That's my wife and daughter. Uh, my daughter even built her own Google Assistant with a Raspberry Pi that she'd won in a coding competition at the age of 10. So I was well chuffed. Then, after a bit, I changed jobs. I ceased being a consumer and a customer, and I became a, a lead product developer, a coder for a Texas-based global mainframe software company called BMC Software. Uh, and that's what the mainframe looks like now, not the old huge, massive data center thing. It's just the size of a big fridge, and it's hundreds of times more powerful. So my team is spread over the world from Texas, India, Israel, Mexico. Uh, this, the, the flexibility allowed me to work from home, and believe me, you don't really want to commute from Cardiff to Texas every day. <laughs> Uh, and it enabled me to continue with my volunteering. So after COVID lockdown, I started a code club in my wife's uh, junior school. Um, we meet Friday lunchtimes. Uh, we get around 16 kids each session. This time, it's 50 to 70% of them are girls. And the, the key was to hold the code club a lunchtime on a Friday when the AstroTurf is open. Think about that. Let that sink in. So most of the girls didn't want to play football. The only boys that didn't want to play football are the ones who are interested in coding. So obviously, being a Welsh medium school, uh, it's a Welsh medium code club. We played with Scratch, Microbits, Python. Uh, we got a Raspberry Pi. I brought my own Raspberry Pi with Sense Hats, uh, mucking around with LEDs. I even built a bis biscuit cam, which I am, after the last presentation, definitely going to submit this as a coolest project. That's the teacher that uh, helps me with the code club. The biscuit cam is a Raspberry Pi powered by a mobile phone charger uh, tucked into a biscuit tin, connected to my phone's hotspot with a motion sensor and a camera. When you open the lid, it takes your photo, tweets it using the Twitter API, and with a message, step, step away from the biscuits. <laughs> so the kids, are they just love that idea. So I'm going give to give them the instructions and all the kit and say, right, you do it and submit that to Coolest, uh, Coolest Projects. And because you heard it, heard it here first, if anybody else has that idea, I'll sue them. <coughs> I won't really. Uh, we then had a trip to the Raspberry Pi production facility at the Sony UK Technology Centre in Pencoyde, Wales. I mean, after all, it was literally down the road. Uh, we saw the fantastic machinery, the robot arms and everything with a massive tub of Vaseline on top to keep the, all the arms moving. 
And the kids loved it. They coded traffic lights uh, using LEDs. They each had their own uh, Raspberry Pis. They did it in Scratch, and then they did it all over again, but in Python to give them a, a feel of uh, how the different, the different, how you can do the same project, but using different languages. Even our wonderful and enthusiastic Code Club coordinator, Sarah, had fun with us. And uh, a couple of months later, Sony gave us a Raspberry Pi 4 as a gift, which was fab because you couldn't get one for love nor money. So throughout this period, running a Welsh language code club, um, I was thrilled that many of the uh, resources for, for Raspberry Pi and Code Club were already in Welsh. There you go, Cymraeg, that's Welsh for Welsh. <coughs> and in Wales, Wales uh, Welsh is an official language. Uh, it's mandatory to some level at all state schools between uh, four, five, and 18. All public signage and documents have to be bilingual. So I did notice that some of the resources weren't totally translated or completely translated. So I thought, well, if I'm using them, I'd just as well help out and translate them. So I signed up to volunteer my copious spare time and as father of three teenage daughters to, uh, to join the uh, Welsh translation team and translate some of the online resources. Uh, yeah, I was using them, so I thought I'd help out. Um, I signed up to the Scratch uh, team channel, whatever you want to call it, and noticed there were about eight or more other named Welsh translators there. I thought, great, there's going to be a nice little team of us. Q, whistling winds, tumbleweeds, crickets. Nope, nope, just me. So... Uh, this is my journey. Um, the translation was actually easier than I'd thought. Uh, we used Jira, which is an open source product, to manage all of the tasks. So um, all of the, the projects are broken down, and you just pick one. The tool Crowdin is used to manage the translation strings. Google Translate has improved fantastically recently. Five, ten, well, five years ago, ten years ago, it was awful. I mean, it was pants. Um, well, well, Welsh has got, uh, uh, the Welsh, Welsh grammar is difficult. You've got translation, you've, you've got mutations, they're called. So um, the first consonant of a, of a word mutates from hard to soft depending on whether it's a male or feminine or masculine noun uh, whether it's um, uh, whether there's a preposition in front of it all sorts and you just didn't have a clue what where, what google translate was spewing out at you and there were frequent um, news reports of how embarrassing google translate was if you didn't speak Welsh, you just put it in, cut and paste, and put it on a big public sign. It was excruciatingly embarrassing. Um, there was, I don't know whether you saw the one sign uh, on, a, on a road road sign which said um, diversion, and then the Welsh translation was, uh, excuse me, but I'm away from my desk right now. Please submit any. <laughs> Any um, any messages for translation to the following email address, and that was just stuck on a road sign. Uh, there was one in a, a, a large uh, super uh, supermarket, which uh, shall remain nameless, and you had uh, Green Gwyn and Green Koch, which is uh, no, yeah, you had red wine and white wine, but they were translated as. Uh, Green Gwyn and Gwyn Koch, which is white wine and white red. Um, you've also got uh, wines and spirits. Green Oedd a Gwyrodydd, which is the correct word, or Green Oedd a Casprydion, which is wines and ghosts. <laughs> so Google Translate has improved. Um, 
so what you uh, if once you've used um, what you use crowd in for a while it begins to learn what the correct translation ought to be and it brings up uh, some suggestions uh, here is only one but you can have you you can choose from as many suggestions as it thinks fits what your translation is this is to certify that and you can either pick one or write your own so there's there's plenty of flexibility um, a lot of the stuff that Maya has given me recently has already been it's worked out what needs to be done and it's pretty close so I just go yeah close enough click yeah close enough click and it's really that simple sometimes it does come up with really bizarre translations and uh, yeah you just gotta translate it yourself and we use slack to keep in touch with each other the translation team are really a friendly bunch um, so much so we had lunch yesterday <laughs> a bunch of us and I even appeared on BBC Radio Cymru which is the Welsh radio service talking about translating Code Club into Welsh and because of that that radio appearance we had a, we have a new recruit she actually hasn't translated anything yet or joined any of the any of the chats but still <laughs> um, so my company is committed to helping the community and it provides everyone in the company with two days a year to do volunteering work like planting trees cleaning riverbanks etc or helping out in schools and communities so last year on Martin Luther King Day which is January the 16th we were all given an extra volunteering day uh, to honor his legacy of community impact. So my colleagues around the world, they would clean up beaches in California, they clean up canals in Amsterdam, and they'd help out at schools in India. Have you ever seen, or have you been to Wales in January? So with the approval of my director, um, I and, and the, the wonderful Maya Manolovic of the Raspberry Pi translation team, I spent my volunteering day inside, in the warmth, translating a whole bunch of uh, Raspberry Pi web pages. So later on, that, that worked. Maya was happy. I was dry, so I was happy. So later on in 2022, I contacted Maya about the possibility of running a translation day in conjunction with my company's Martin Luther King Day in 2023. So she and Sabina, who sit in there, who's a manager, who runs the translation team, they were thrilled. So I got things rolling. The volunteering organization in my company, BMC Software, it's called BMC Cares, hence the T-shirt, plug. Uh, I set up a, re um, a registration page, socialized it amongst the 7,000 employees worldwide, and sat back. So Maya was a little scared that she might have to manage 7,000 translators across all the time zones for a whole 24-hour period, but uh, it was not to be. Uh, I managed to help out a little bit, um, so I captained the whole thing. That's my evidence. So after a few initial teething problems, we got started with some really positive results. Uh, we translated five languages. We had, of the 21 people who had initially expect, expressed an interest, uh, we had seven volunteers. Um, we completed 21 tasks, and everybody enjoyed it and wanted to do it again, uh, especially Sabina <laughs> and Maya, uh, because, hey, it was just free resource, so thanks to BMC. So please, try it for, try it for yourself. If you are a polyglot, if you can speak more than one language, the Raspberry Pi translation team will be knocking on your door. Any questions, just speak to me. I've been Marcus Davidge mostly, and you can hit me up on any social media anywhere on the planet by the tag Spoofy Doo. Thank you very much. Any questions? Of course not, it's lunchtime.
Champions. I hope you're all enjoying the event so far and are feeling ready for another talk. Um, if not, then please try and push past the urge to have an afternoon nap after such an amazing lunch. Um, I'll be taking you through the session. I'm Steph, for those that haven't met me yet. I'm the UK Community Manager for Coda Dojo. And I was hoping to be joined by my wonderful colleague, Nolene, who's our community manager in Ireland today. As you might have spotted, unfortunately, she's not here. Um, so she's really disappointed not to be joining us for this session. But I will do my best to share the information with you that she was going to cover today as well. So what we are going to cover today is volunteer role descriptions, where to find volunteers, and how to use our new volunteer recruitment resources. And we're also going to speak a little bit about welcoming and onboarding volunteers too. So just to set the scene a little, some of the ideas and the resources that we're going to show you today are taken from our wider volunteer recruitment framework. So this is something we've recently put together. It was in response to our annual survey last year. So you, our community, told us you'd like some more resources, an extra bit of help on recruiting volunteers. So we heard a lot of our clubs were looking to refresh and regrow their pools of volunteers following all of the ch challenges of the pandemic. Um, so if you want to find out more detail on the whole recruitment framework, you can find it all on our webpage, which I'll share with you later. There's going to be a lot of QR codes, so there'll be lots to share. Um, so before we get started with role descriptions, it would be really good just to um, see in the room, is anybody looking actively at the moment to recruit volunteers for their clubs? Anybody on the lookout at the moment? A few of you, yeah. <laughs> it's always good to be on the lookout, isn't it? And keep those numbers manageable and sustainable for your club. Um, if you're not looking, hopefully when the time comes, the session will be useful because you'll know where to find all of our resources and hopefully have some ideas too. So if you are actively recruiting, you've probably already had a think about the type of help that your dojo might benefit from, some of those specific tasks where you might need a bit of extra support. And if you've done this reflection, it's a really good idea to then put together a volunteer role description. These are really helpful when you're recruiting so that new volunteers and others in your dojo have a really clear idea on who's doing what. Um, so to help, we have put together some template role descriptions. Um, the key thing is that they are templates. The roles are absolutely not set in stone. They're for you to change, adapt, make them your own. We want them to be flexible and a good fit for the people that come forward for the roles. So role descriptions should cover the basics, really. Um, a role title, some of the tasks that are involved, aims and expectations, the location, the timings, and so on. But you might want to bring them to life a little bit. So you could add things in about why somebody might want to volunteer with your club, what they might get back from volunteering, and how they're going to contribute to what you're bringing to your community. So try to make them sound exciting um, and open to people with different levels of skills and people from different backgrounds. So. Here are the example roles that we have some templates for. Um, and when you come to edit them, it's a really good idea if you can add in some personal qualities and some of the more general skills that might complement these different roles. What we don't want is for people to read the roles and feel put off if they don't think that they're an exact match for the list of tasks and the specific skills that are on there. We want people to see them and know that whatever they have to offer is of value to the club. So whether that's a transferable skill, an interest, enthusiasm, or 10 years worth of coding experience, we want people to feel involved. It's also worth remembering that people might be attracted to these roles if they're looking to develop new skills in these areas too. So it's really worth highlighting. These roles are a platform for learning, building new experiences. Um, so remember to add that in as well when you're recruiting. So we've got some ideas to help you out on some of these qualities and experiences you might want to add to the different roles. Um, so looking at the champion, I feel like I don't need to tell you what a champion is all about because I think we've got lots in the room. So it's about someone having that passion and that excitement and drive to lead the club and run it forward. Um, somebody looking to take up this role might be interested in developing their leadership skills or getting more experience working with a team. But it's someone who can make sure that everybody's in the right place at the right time. And then the technical mentor. So obviously you're going to be looking for somebody who's got some coding experience or a technical background, but be open to what that looks like. Not everybody's going to come to you as an expert. 
Um, and as well, people in this role will be looking to develop new skills too. They might want to try out some mentoring skills or get some experience on engaging with young people. And then the guidance mentor. So there are so many different qualities that can bring this role to life. It's very flexible. You might be looking for someone who's very patient, welcoming, approachable. They might come from a creative arts background or they might have a youth experience background. And somebody in this role, maybe they've heard of coding before, don't really know what it is, want to try it out and build some skills by volunteering at your club. And then the final role, and it's worth pointing out as well, this is the third role on the screen that doesn't actually require you to have any existing coding skills. So the pool of people that you can recruit from is actually quite wide and quite varied. So hopefully that helps you out. Um, again, this role is very flexible. Someone who's organized is always on top of their emails. Maybe they're helping behind the scenes if they're not so confident to come along to the clubs. Um, someone who can communicate clearly. They can liaise with the venue, send some emails out to the parents and carers. And again, people could be looking to get new skills in this role. Maybe they want to manage a Facebook page for your dojo and develop their social media skills. So where are you going to find all of these wonderful volunteers? Um, when you start looking for people, it's really tempting to cast a wide net. And you might need to eventually, but you can save yourself a lot of time and effort if you start off looking closer to your dojo. So think about people who are already connected to your club the venue staff, friends, colleagues of your existing volunteers? Are there some people who use the venue space as well with similar interests? Parents, carers of the young people? And then the wider community, and don't be restricted to the ideas on the screen because everybody's community is going to be different. Think about who the key people and places are in your local area. Is there a volunteer organization, businesses, universities, schools, libraries? It's gonna be different for all of us. So, having a little think again about the people who are connected with your dojo. Parents and carers are really well placed um, to be volunteers in your club. Often they attend the sessions, so they're already in the right place at the right time. They've probably already got some kind of connection with your club and your community, or maybe an interest as well in tech or an interest in what their young people are doing. Um, and some parents and carers, build a relationship with the club and they're not ready to move on even when the young person's outgrown it. So they want to keep that relationship there. Don't feel awkward about approaching them. It's complimentary to be asked to be volunteering. So it shows that somebody's seen a value in your skills and your interests. Um, so if you are finding it a little bit uncomfortable to start the conversations or not sure how to navigate it, we have put together a conversation guide, which you can find on our help desk. Well, if you're quick enough, you can scan the QR code there. Um, and if you prefer a different option, we have some template letters as well that you can hand out or adapt to be an email. Um, but it's really worth reaching out to these people and it's a really nice compliment to be asked to get involved too. Um, another approach, so people who are connected with your club that you already know, you could try asking them to get involved with a task. So this is all about making it very easy for someone to say yes by asking them to do something very simple. So it could be as simple as, could you put up this poster in the supermarket next time you're there? Do you have 10 minutes to help me pack away these laptops at the end of the session? It's about finding something that's really easy for them to say yes to so that they can test things out, see what it's like to get involved and hopefully build on that involvement and that commitment in a longer term. So now we're looking at connecting with those people who are wider in the community. Think about who they are for you and how you're going to get your message in front of them. Is it social media? Is it the local press? Is there an event or a workplace that everybody's at? So we've developed some resources that will hopefully help you spread the word as wide and far as you need to. The first one, you might have seen these in your swag packs if you've got a dojo pack. Little cards, you can print these out, add in your dojo details, take them along um, to an event or to work, and next time somebody asks about volunteering, you can seamlessly hand them one of your cards with the dojo details on to follow up with. We have some posters. Again, you can use these by printing them off and putting them everywhere in your community, or you can use them digitally as well. Put your dojo details on, and as well, there's a selection of images on the poster, so you can choose the one that best represents your club. 
tip with posters, remember where you've put them in case you want to take them back down again or update them rather than leaving them everywhere across the community. And we have some social media cards as well. So these are ready to go for Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Um, we have some example text that you might want to put alongside these, so whether you want to post or tweet alongside these images. And think about as well, if people aren't already following your social media, who are they looking at and who do you need to get involved to help you get the message in front of the right people? And the final idea on how to approach people is a more personalised ask. So if there's a particular organisation or a business that you think is going to be a really good fit for volunteers in your community, it's really worth reaching out with a direct personal ask. This shows someone you're really inviting them specifically to get involved and you're more likely to get a response. So we have two different template letters for you to use. One is directly for technical mentors and the other is for volunteers in general. So choose the one that's the best fit for you um, and send them off. If you don't have a contact, it's worth having a little Google um, on people's websites. See if you can find a contact in their corporate social responsibility team. They are the people to get to who want to connect with the community and reach out and get involved with volunteering. So if all your hard work is paid off and you have a volunteer to onboard, there are a few things you need to do um, as initial steps of onboarding your new volunteer. The first is to get a background check. Um, now this is going to be different for everyone depending on the country that your dojo is based in, um, but that's the first action. All volunteers should have the right background check in place. And then they should be starting a Raspberry Pi account if they haven't already got one. They need to join your dojo on the Zen platform so that you can all communicate and manage the dojo together on the platform there. And having the Pi account will mean you can access all of our free training too. And there is one piece of training that all volunteers need to complete, and that is our safeguarding module. Um, so you need to be logged into your Pi account in order for us to um, track your progress and record the completion of this course as well. And finally, the other um, piece on here is to read our code of behaviour and agree to our Coda Dojo charter. And while it's important to do all of those steps with onboarding, it's really important to give new volunteers a warm welcome too. Um, so take some time to get to know them, make them feel included and part of the team right from day one. Um, take some time to get to know them even if you already know that person and try not to make assumptions about their skills, their confidence, because it might be different to what you think. Um, connect them up with a buddy in your dojo, this can really help settle nerves, there's somebody there for them to go to with their questions in those first few sessions, it can help build their confidence. We want people to feel comfortable and enjoy their experience and keep coming back. So there's also the, the challenge of keeping volunteers interested, particularly when you're waiting on those background checks to come through. So there's some things that you can do here to keep that momentum going and keep them engaged while they're waiting to come along. You might want to share um, some plans if you've got some sessions coming up with particular projects. So share those projects so that they can get familiar with them, they can get excited and ready to be involved. Um, you can ask them to sign up to our newsletter, join our Slack community and let them know about any training opportunities if they want to get prepared. So that's all we're going to cover on our volunteer recruitment framework in this session. Um, but if you would like to get some more guidance around recruiting volunteers, we have a new training module. Um, so you can do this online in your own time, at your own pace, and it will guide you through step by step all of the different stages in recruiting volunteers and how to use our resources and where to find them along the way as well. Again, if you weren't quick enough to get the QR code, <laughs> there's another one on this slide. Um, so all of the resources and content that we've talked about today, um, you'll find on our new dedicated volunteer recruitment webpage. Um, so this is a one-stop shop for all things volunteer recruitment. Um, we hope that you find everything you need on there. But if you do have any ideas for new resources or anything else that you would find useful in helping you get more volunteers on board or retaining them, then please do get in touch and let us know. Um, you can reach out with our contacts that are on the screen. And while Nolene wasn't here to join us today, I know she would love to hear any questions or ideas that you've got as well. Um, if you would like to keep up to date with all of our latest news, resources, and community events for Coda Dojo, then also check out our community webpage. 
Um, but yeah, that's all from me today. So thank you so much for listening and I really hope you enjoy the rest of the event.
Julia. Thank you. Thanks. Lovely. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Kashida Sain and I'm here with Dave Morley today. And we are going to be talking about how Scratch powers our dojo. I click. No? Right. Um, yes, so my role is to give access to the collection at the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre, which is the stores and studios for Royal Museum's Greenwich. We have at least 2.5 million objects within our collection, and that is across the Cutty Sark, the Royal Observatory, National Maritime Museum, and the Queen's House. Now, you're probably wondering, <laughs> why we run a Coda Dojo at PPMCC. And it's because we like to think of it as a community hub. Um, when we opened in around 2019 to the public, we wanted to have more of a community involvement and listen to what they wanted. Through that, Coda Dojo seemed to be the most ideal club to run. We've seen so many children and parents throughout the years and can proudly say it's a successful club. Not only are the participants learning about coding skills and techniques, we get to take them behind the scenes to show them an object which in turn inspires them. And we really believe that having an opportunity to be face to face with an object really enriches our dojo. I have to say our dojo wouldn't be as successful as it is without Dave, <laughs> um, who is our facilitator. And Dave, would you like to explain how you joined us? Okay, thank you, Kashid. Cool. Right, um, thanks for making it so far. I know it's a bit of a graveyard shift now, but you've, the, the stamina is kicking in by now, and the second cup of coffee. I'll be as quick as I can. Right, our dojo history. I ran a tiny dojo a couple of miles from the, light, from the uh, museum um, using Code Club projects, and I used to Google to frantically find stuff for scratch. And I had run some code clubs before. Um, my dojo wasn't very big, so um, I, was, I was working on it anyway. And then Kashid approached me and said, come and, work, come and work with us. We're a big museum. We've got fantastic facilities. So I joined them instead. Uh, we started in 2019. We stopped for the pandemic and then restarted again in November to, uh, 2021. So basically, some of the tips that, that we found as we'd gone along. The question was, what do you do with your dojo once you run out of scratch projects, either on the Code Club or the do Coda Dojo site? And I wasn't very sure. I did know that Raspberry Pi hardware projects looked very scary, much scarier than putting the Kia wardrobes together. I know that. And so it was a case of what, what we do. And so we decided we develop our own coding projects. Now, I'm very much not a programmer, but the good news is I'm retired, so I've got time. So I got Scratch projects, took them apart, and put them back together. And in doing that, I learned how Scratch works. And so I could, with a bit of luck, in the 20 minutes I've got, I'll take you through and show you how we did it. And I've come up with 10 principles. We use, by the way, scratch lab blocks. They're much clearer than the normal scratch blocks. You've got much better contrast. And the story says that scratch themselves will update to these scratch lab blocks very soon. The, late, the later version of scratch will use these blocks instead of the, the normal blocks you get. They're also easier to print and definitely much clearer when you're reading them. So that's my attitude. 10, ten hints and tips. So let's see what they are. Number one, find a theme and where you, where you can multiple costumes. Give people a choice. We print sheets. Our ninjas have a range of these projects. They're printed out and just placed on a table and they pick what they want. I've been to dojos where it's all done electronically. You flick between a website and where you're working in Scratch and it's fine in theory, but. If you're someone, a mentor coming up behind them, you don't know where they are. And you can't help them debugging because you don't know where the hell they are. The beauty of a sheet is I can say to the kids, where are you? And they say, oh, I'm on this step. And you say, great, you're doing really well. You've only got a few more bits to do. Or you can say, oh, this isn't working. 
Try this bit. That's probably where your bug is. A piece of paper works and does that. Also, the parents sitting next to them can help. They can help to dictate some of this because they can, they can, they've actually got the script in front of them. The other thing is, although I give a description of what to do on the left-hand side, the kids don't read it. But all the blocks are on the right. They just follow the right. I've got a picture of the sprite and the blocks that go with it, and they just do it. They don't even need to read the instructions. So we find that works. Print things out. It's cheap. We grade projects to suit the experience. Not everyone can do everything. So if I get a new tiny ninja, I don't give them a complicated project because they're going to fail. Um, because time's always a constraint, as it is today, we use a standard presentation and basically go through the rules of the game because we get a lot of new parents and ninjas coming through. So it saves time. We don't just do games. Okay, I, I tend, or people tend to think of Scratch as being games, games, games. We tell stories, we do lots of patterns, and we follow current events. And I'll explain a bit more about what we do there later on. Um, I recommend you explore the Scratch site, which has got, God knows, 100 and, was it 107 million? I've got a slide that tells you. YouTube is now becoming fairly popular for um, Scratch hints. Scratch books, Scratch wiki. I look at what's there and remix it. And if I find a neat piece of code, I put it into Scratch and think, oh, I might use that later on. That's really cool, that bit. That does that. That's fantastic. We use sound. When I started, I didn't use any sound at all. I, I thought it was all about the code. If you add sound, you've got a whole new dimension. And there are a number of websites I'll tell you about which you can use, which give you free sounds by the million that you can put into your project. And suddenly, you've got something really special. Experiment. This is for, not just for me, for the ninjas as well. But I've probably got, at any one time, half a dozen projects on the go. Four or five of them might not come to anything. One will. But I'll learn something from all of them. We use complementary programs. We don't just use Scratch. And I've discovered that animation works very, very well together with Scratch. And again, I'll explain some of that. And finally, customize projects. I give them a script. They follow it. But at the end of that, they can tweak it and make it theirs. It's not all about following my script and that's the end of it. Because then you do my project and what I've, I've designed. They can take it on further by changing it, using their imagination. And even if they don't know how to, they can explain to me what they would do if they could, which is half the battle after all. It's about imagination. So let's have a look. So what we do is we, we use a range of Scratch projects and we add other things. And as I said before, animation is a fantastic fit with coding. Go on then, that's it, and disappear. Well done. Time spent looking for characters is never time wasted. And that applies, we use them both in coding and in animation. We barely use the standard Scratch sprites that Scratch comes with. And I thought, how can I find a universe that I can use? And then I found Scribblenauts. Scribblenauts is a whole world, 6,000 files that are all available to use and are copyright free based on an existing computer game or games, and you could extract them and use them in Scratch. So that's my bonus idea, my 11th idea. Here are a few of them, and if I go on the next couple of screens, there's some more, and so on. So you've got a whole world you could construct, either in Scratch or using animation, whatever. I very often blur backgrounds because otherwise things are just too busy. So I, I use blurred backgrounds. You don't need detailed backgrounds usually when you're animating. And they're all your characters, and you can tell whatever story you want because you've got all the characters you'll ever need. So scribble noughts is a very good tip. Okay, going back to our original point, themes, sprite libraries. Obviously, being a maritime museum, we've got a maritime theme. So I'm thinking sea-based projects, ships, the sea. <coughs> But also, because we have the Greenwich Observatory, we also use space. So there's my two obvious themes for my projects. 
I've got a unifying theme now, but I'm just writing random projects about anything that, happens to, that I happen to think of. Luckily, I'd already chosen space for my... This works, should do. Here we go. So here's a, a project in... Ah, except it isn't. No, it's only on there. Never mind. I'll move on. I'll move swiftly on. No, that's not working either now. Oh dear. Just come out of there. Let's try that. Yes. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about the projects at the end. I use GIMP, which is a free program, to take images, remove the backgrounds, and, and squirt them into Scratch. So, as an example, that's something from, Scri from Scribble Notes, a whale. So I took that, extracted it from, took its background off, messed around with the color, opened its mouth, and then I put it into PowerPoint. PowerPoint will enable you to add shadow, so you get, if not 3D, 2.5D, if you like, and you can add a bit of texture. That's got a bit of texture on it. You do all that in PowerPoint. So we've gone from that to something which is virtually unrecognizable from the original image. And you can manipulate images in that way using GIMP, which is like a free version of Photoshop. I mean, if you're that desperate, spend money on Photoshop. But GIMP will do anything that it's, it's a, a free program. I have a library of sprites that I've discovered over the years. So when I start a project, I've already got all this ready, which means when I write a game or whatever, I can offer lots of costumes and lots of choice to my ninjas. Same for space, astronauts, and the same for aliens, and so on. OK, we print projects, as I explained at the beginning, point two. More reliable, you don't need the internet. Our Wi-Fi is very flaky. If it's all printed out, you don't need the Wi-Fi. And as I've said, we can help them debug because we know exactly where they are on the sheet of paper, and the parents can help. Motivates kids, gives them a choice of what to do. If they get bored, they can go and get another one. And then we just load things up by using a USB stick to give them the sprites that they need, and off they go. Typical project. So the inspiration is something in the museum, blockade of Toulon, where a couple of English ships um, shot at a group of French ships that were returning to Toulon, the port. And up there on the, um, up on the um, hill there, you can see a fort. So I came up with ship, fort, battery, and another ship. In the end, I didn't use French and English because the differences would be a tiny little flag. You could barely see it in scratch. So I used an ordinary ship and a pirate ship. So that's how I interpreted the story to make it visible. And we ended up with that, which is my printed sheet using the Scratch Lab blocks. And there are my instructions. This is how you do it. With a pictorial guide to all the sprites. And there we are. Okay, that's the full instructions for the game. Uh, features of the project. The simplest project is get the boat past the Kraken. That's it. Really, really simple. Tiniest Ninja can do that. Obviously, more complicated games have got timers and high scores and everything else. You can get as complicated as you want to, but basically, it's like a simple chase, the simplest games. But every project I do, every new project I do now has a difficulty, difficulty guide so that somebody starting new knows how complicated the game is or, or the task is before they start. And that helps everybody. And as I've said already, we don't offer just games, we offer animations, patterns, and digital stories. To make things quick, because time's always of the essence, I don't know about you at a dojo, but every hour at a dojo seems like 10 minutes, I have a standard presentation, which tells them the program, the most important sheet is this, which says, what we're going to do this month and gives them the new projects I've written that month for them. It just explains in three or four words exactly what that's about. So here we are drawing patterns. Oh, the middle one works. Okay, I can't click on the others. No, I'm not going to try because, oh, that's working now. So this is based on a sine wave. This just rotates and this one 
Are you going to work? Yes, you are. So these are typical patterns you can produce in Scratch very, very easily. And the beauty of this is once you've done it, you can say, okay, play around with the pen size, play around with the color, play around with the speed. You can produce something totally different to this in two minutes by playing around with the numbers and the angles. Really, really simple. You're just playing with geometry in the end and mathematics, but it's just by changing two or three numbers. They can get something which I've never seen before and they've created themselves based on this. We do topical projects. Uh, so, for example, Chinese New Year, Valentine's Day, Easter, World Cup football, Christmas, Advent, whatever. You can produce projects that go along with that. I have a look in Scratch first and say, oh, there's not much here. What can I come up with? So we did, did one for Valentine's Day. We've done one for the World Cup with the cat kicking in one of three places, straight on left or right, and the goal goalie randomly saving it. And that was a Christmas thing with the frog climbing to the top of the Christmas tree and with the snow falling. Uh, use the Scratch site for inspiration. 127 million, I said 107, I was nearly there. As of yesterday, 127 million projects on Scratch. Now, if we assume only 1% of those is worth looking at for you, you've still got well over a million to look through, which will keep you busy for a while, I would suggest. Two million are added each month. It's big. It's there, it's all free, and it's all available. And of course, reuse through re remixing is actively encouraged. You could see all the code, so go and have a look. That'll keep, keep you busy for the next 50 years. And basically, that's how I've learned. I've learned by taking projects, pulling them apart, how do they work, and then put them back together. What happens if I change this? What happens if I take this out? So that's how I've learned. And the other thing to say is, nearly every ninja you're teaching is using Scratch already at school, because that, it's one of the standard tools they use in primary schools to teach kids computing. So it's not new. I always ask, when, when I get a new ninja, do you use Scratch at school? And if they say no, I say, I'll get my coat. Because 95% of them have used Scratch before. Sites to look at, Jackson's Academy, Al Swiger has, has still, I think, written one of the best books on Scratch, been around quite a long time. Uh, that one, Smart Mind, the Scratch team themselves have a very good YouTube site. Zinnia, do not ask. Steam List is very good. They recently, all of these, by the way, have really come to the fore in the last year, I would say. Until about a year ago, there wasn't much on YouTube for Scratch, but now these are coming on. And the best of the lot, Griff Patch. Anyone who uses Scratch seriously who hasn't heard of Griff Patch, I'd take them out and shoot them. They haven't really been paying attention. Griff Patch is a young English programmer who writes incredible Scratch games. Um, as I say, if you haven't heard of Griff Patch and you're writing Scratch games, you should be following his channel. Okay, so that's YouTube ideas. Go to the library, check the junior section of the library, you'll have some Scratch books, borrow them. Go on the Scratch Wiki. Scratch Wiki is full of ideas for in, what you can do with individual blocks and how do I do this in Scratch. It's all there waiting for you. Sound. Yes, you can hear it. If I write a project about the sea, I've got the waves, I've got the dolls, I create an atmosphere already beyond just the code. I use free sound, that's got 600,000 free samples. Sound Bible, I can't work out how big that is. 101 soundboards has got 1 million sounds. They're all there waiting for you, they're all free. You just download them, all you need is a free account. Then you tweak it with Audacity, which again is a free program. And you can trim things with VLC, Audacity, or Scratch itself. It's all there waiting for you. I also use text-to-speech in Scratch. Number eight, experiment, as I said before. I experimented writing a Christmas, a digital Christmas card, and I used Audacity to tweak my voice to make Father Christmas's voice low, and the penguin's voice high. And the punchline was Happy Fishmas, because the idea was 
the Father Christmas gave the penguin fish for Christmas. And the penguin said, happy fishmas, I can't show you because I can't click on the link. And that was all from finding a little bit of code and thinking, what can I do with this? And, oh, I'll play with audacity. But as I've said before, a new project doesn't always work out, but every time I do one, I learn something, even if it fails. Examine existing projects. There was a code club project where you clicked on the lady and she sang, and you clicked on the drum and it drummed. I took that and I ended up with a guitarist and I got the ballerina and turned her into a drummer and we had a whole band and they were talking to each other. All from that original project, which was very, very simple. I just remixed it and remixed it and remixed it by revisiting it. Number nine, complementary programs and sites. Out of code, somebody's mentioned this morning, it's really the American equivalent of well, it's the American equivalent of how you learn coding as a kid. On there, they've got, so since 2013, the Americans have had an initiative using um, Hour of Code, code.org, 227 million now projects and hundreds of activities by grade. I mean, this is quite like Scratch. There's a lot of Scratch projects, but there's all sorts of other things as well that they commission other companies to write for Hour of Code. Lightbot, little character moving around a, um, moving around a, 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 a course and the blue bits, you light a little light and you've got left, right, jump, forward and light the light. Well worth a look to teach programming. Find out who the real programmers are in your ninjas. You'll be surprised. The people you least expect are the natural programmers. Logo. Before there was Scratch, there was Logo. Well before Scratch. You can do amazing patterns in Logo. Fractals, for example, with incredible detail. You can do 3D. I'm not even sure whether Scratch can do 3D patterns. Very, very simple. Just one line of code to produce these patterns. And then you very... You vary the colors and you vary the width of the pen and you end up with these incredible patterns. PowerPoint, you can animate using PowerPoint, using either static or GIFs. So all you do is you get a slide, you duplicate it and you move something on the second slide. Then you copy that, third slide, and you move something and you copy that and so on. And it's like stop animation. You play it back one slide every second. You've got an animation using PowerPoint. Who knew? You can get online hundreds and hundreds of sprite sheets, all free, from people who've spent hours taking them out of computer games. They're all there waiting for you in any pose you want. And all you do is split them up, stick them in your PowerPoint. You can get game backgrounds in a similar way. They're all sitting there on the internet waiting for you. All you do is put the two together. And you've got yourself an animation. Nearly everyone's got access to PowerPoint. Pivot. One of my favorite programs. Very, very simple animation program. Okay? Little, little moving little stick characters. Really, really simple. You're telling a story. Okay? It's free. It only works on Windows, by the way, so the Apple techies have to use something else. Finally, customizing projects. You don't have to finish with my sheet, as I've said before. We encourage ninjas to move on from that and make the projects their own by tweaking it. So it might mean, is the difficulty right for you? Because obviously I pick a difficulty, it won't be what the kid needs. So they change it to make it the right level of challenge for them. Change the costume, simple to do. Add a timer, put a new sprite in, put some sounds in, whatever. That's where they use their imagination. What would improve it? We're virtually there. So, to, to summarize, if you get a sprite library, you add the sprite site, the scratch site, and you add the museum archive that we visit most sessions, you get inspiration. If you add to that my limited scratch skills, you end up with some original projects. If you take original projects plus our fantastic hosts, and you add complementary activities I've described, you end up with engaged ninjas, which is what we all want, after all. And there we are, Scratch Dojo. 
So, last slide. Thank you for your time. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you.
want to give the cue? Yeah. I guess I'm going to, can you guys hear me? Oh, here we go, yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, that was an awesome presentation and inspirational. So um, we've had a lot of talks today with everybody. So I'm just going to get started, I think. Uh, we have a small crowd, so I'm a little bit less nervous. Um, yeah, so I'm here from Aruba. And uh, this is our little, uh, little initiative. This is our Coder Dojo. We're called Aru Coder Dojo. We weren't allowed to call it Aruba, so we put our flag in. And um, we've also added some partnerships uh, that we work with on our island. And I want to share what we do with you guys. And um, we come as humble as we can. We're a little bit of a microcosmos. So we, we, we reach things really quickly. We're only 32 miles. Uh, we're a small little island in the Caribbean. Uh, this is a very polygonal version of the Caribbean region, but upstairs is Cuba, and downstairs is Colombia and Venezuela, and we're that little dot right there, and that's our little flag. Um, but we like to think we're like Mighty Mouse a little bit, right? Um, yeah, so we started Coda Dojo about a year and a half ago. We started in our national library. We recently got a sponsorship and we signed a signage agreement with uh, the, the, the um, Biblioteca Nacional, that's how we call it in our native language, Papimento. And those are designers that helped us out. Um, so we have a Coda Dojo in our main city, that's uh, in the library, Oranjestad, means Orange City in Dutch. We also have one in the other branch in St. Nicholas. And we recently got the YMCA to open a closed one for their patrons. And we're going to be supporting them as much as we can. Uh, for the next six months, we'll be also going there and helping out a tutor um, and teaching them about the Raspberry ecosystem in general. Um, and we got approval, I think, five days ago for the first elementary school with the Code Club. So uh, I th we're pretty proud of that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so these are, this is a sh photo of after we installed our new sign. I highly recommend doing that. It gives these, the children sort of a connected feeling. It becomes not a borrowed space. It becomes a official space. So they come to the Coder do do Dojo that's internationally connected. Um, and diversity is the name of the game. So we have parents, artists. Um, that's my wife on the right. My son is a mentor. Tanya is also part of the team as a champion. That's my colleague right there. And uh, we just have as much fun as we can, but we have to motivate and keep continuing that journey as much as we can. Um, this is a photo of uh, our girls in St. Nicholas, which is a different type of community. They're very independent. They take the bus. You wouldn't believe it, but on Aruba, we have to take buses. Um, they, they actually tra travel 45 minutes just to come to the dojo all on their own. And um, we just recognized them. We gave them a Koto Dojo certificate of course, and um, they were busy with Tinkercad, and we also gave them a little bit of a school package. So, so we spent about eight pounds just to give them a little extra. So we like doing that, creating that incentive um, a little bit. So we invest. Uh, that's our, another one of our volunteers, Megan, helps us out with the girls. It's good to have a champion and a mentor that is female and bubbly. And that's actually a lieutenant of the police force, and he's very interested in innovation and he comes to help out every now and again. So that was a little bit about Coder Dojo and sharing with you guys what we do in a volunteer perspective. I'm here all, also to share with you uh, our foundation called Full Stack Vision Foundation and the scope of work that spin off from our knowledge that we gain doing Coder Dojo. So what is the mission? The mission is creating the foundations for knowledge in the digital sector and providing opportunities for Aruba and the borderless economy. It's a mouthful, but um, on Aruba, after COVID, we experienced a total economic shutdown. And myself as a creative industry uh, participant uh, saw the devastation that that causes. We have only one pillar of tourism, which is um, tourism, right? Um, so this is our team from the foundation. So T Tanya is my strategy officer. She's involved with connect, making connections, understanding our landscape. Uh, we have a very intense governmental apparatus, and she knows a lot about that. 
Um, I'm the managing director, but I come from a creative industry background, multimedia, you know, from Photoshop to WordPress has been my job for a long time and COVID destroyed it. And we had to reinvent our activities. And I'm actually happy it happened because here I am with you guys in England for the first time talking about what we do. Um, Akeem is a liaison from the, national, the, the infrastructure company called Utilities. So they're, they're responsible for Aruba's water and energy. And he's written a thesis on waste. And he's actually joined our team um, to help us out digitizing Aruba uh, in a sustainable way. And Megan is our marketing and PR and she communicates everything we do. Um, oh, and one last thing. Tanya and I worked for four years in special projects in the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor. And that's where we kind of learned about community impact. And out of that, we reacted with this, what we're showing you today. So it's now shifted a little bit to creating a resilient Aruba facing the challenges of, of opportunity for people, energy, and the climate. As a Caribbean citizen, we're at the front lines. We notice the change. We're the, our sister uh, countries, because we're from the Dutch Antilles, that's a couple of islands. Um, St. Martin is always hit really badly. And we really believe that the activities that can come out of uh, the Coda Dojo fat raspberry ecosystem is an answer to resilience. You know, people can set up things quickly and solve their own problems. So we say we're, so, uh, it's called Sustainable Development Goals. We're 100% aligned and we're 99% feasible because it's all about scale. How many dojos can I set up? How many children can get involved in, in computer making? And how many teachers can start promoting it is all about scale. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of the first part, my recap of last year. Um, of course, there was a World Cup, so we themed it on that. And of course, they made a, a couple of soccer games. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit about my, my work there at Coder Dojo, but the spin-offs that came after. Uh, slide of our kids, the diversity is there. Um, here's the, another space, so this is St. Nicholas. And I don't know about you guys, but I have peaks and valleys of participation because we have an open door policy, but people come and go. Um, we also have a little bit of that bus problem where some girl got grounded and she has to be home at 4.30 and she doesn't come anymore. You know, so that's, that's kind of an issue. But um, we, 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 we fluctuate. A couple of the creations. Um, we already started with the making and that's all done by my, 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 my staff and my mentors, my, my friends and even parents. So we're very, very happy about that. But uh, the last presentation is gonna help me, you know, be active on originality, I think. I think that's a great way to approach uh, the dojo. And last slide, um, we also download the books and print them. That's a little bit of a service we do. So we go to, the, to some stakeholders and say, hey, listen, man, pay for these books for me, as in print them, give them to me, I pay for the binding, and I have a, a plethora of books. So that's how we solve getting the books donated. And of course, we, we also give the magpie some, some, some contributions of five pounds and whatnot. Um, I don't limit the experiences to just scratch. I myself, I'm an ex-musician, you could say, so I bring all my stuff and I see what happens. I show them a doll that's Ableton Live. I just wanted to get inspired and creating music is also important. So sound is definitely something in our peripheral. We did um, the Mission Zero, uh, I think two weeks ago, if I would guess correctly, but we use that as an incentive. So when I recognize talent, they get invited to come do Mission Zero and how we approach it, we create an experience around it. So this is our, in our office, we have an office in the Dr. Chung Center. I'll tell you more about that. And we got donations from party centers and they gave, gave us the lights. And we created sort of a capsule experience, sort of a center, you know, they're gonna go on a mission. So the parents come in, they give it to my mentor, with their mentor, which is Jean-Luc. And they go in there and I've created the space and I have sounds of space. And they have to do that mission and feel like they're really going in there, you could say, sort of like a NASA space camp. You know, so, and, and we did very little. We got the lights for free. We set it up on Saturday. They get two hours. 
and um, we put some food for the parents, and they had a blast. I mean, the stories. I mean, the project is amazing that they they get to put the code up there. But we're on Aruba, uh, the Issa State. You know, it's a bit complicated, so I wasn't sure. So I want to make sure that that experience is done and 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 inspirational. Yeah. So these are our kids, just having fun. That's the first time they're doing Python, by the way. They've never done it, and they got through it. So that's how good, how well put together uh, that is from the foundation. So um, if you start working with raspberries, you start flashing drives. So I learned, because I've never known those things. You know, I'm a creative expert. I'm a Photoshopper, a web designer. And I've actually started repurposing computers with that same knowledge, it's the same thing. You, you bring the etcher down, download Linux Fedora, you put a USB drive, flash it, and you've got a new computer. So this actually got delivered. I got this, these computers right here. This is the PS hole, and that's how I started to onboard them because of that. They called us up, we did a little bit of PR, and they said, hey, we're gonna throw these computers away. We're coming. So Tanya and I went there and shoved it all in a little sedan, and I brought it to my office and I spent a whole weekend sifting to what works and doesn't work. It had simply had to start. I didn't open any computers. I didn't install any drives. I put Fedora in and if the Chrome goes online, I'm happy. I've got a computer because most of our ecosystem just needs an internet connection and a browser, right? So I say, do it, get involved. So these are other kids. Uh, that's Mishak Richardson, very talented guitar player. He doesn't look it, but he's 14 years old. And he did it for EduCampus. This, we started giving grants even. So instead of me wasting my talents, I now grant a business card and a website to a school that's going to do a Wiz Lab. So they asked us to help and we donated the website. They paid for the hosting and we created everything for them. And now we're partners. They have children from four to seven, and we have Coda Dojo and Coke Club. So I'm, I'm sort of an ecosystems architect and I promote very aggressively. I got a message, um, that's his nickname, Baba. His name is Ricky. He's an it -er at the bank. And he told me, hey man, I got 10 computers for you. I'm like, great. El papimento. Mapensa cubo por donate se I think we can put Linux. Do it. So next week, I'm getting 10 computers, all done by them. So that ethos, you have to spread that out, that community impact. Um, this is one of our partners. This is Hans Hornstra, and he wrote a book called Digital Intelligence. We met at a conference, and he's in charge of um, helping the Ministry of Education doing better digital practices, and we're the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So it's an easy partnership. Oh. I basically ran a dojo in the university. Those are all teachers. And I treated them like ninjas the first time. And you're gonna get different reactions, of course. And because of that, I actually got a free course of him. So I'm in there with all these other teachers doing his system, which I won't elaborate on now, but it was very cool. He has this system about sailing and vision and recognizing diversity and putting them together in a team. Very cool stuff. You can find him at that website, digitalexploration.com, what he does. We also did some translation work. We helped this website be translated into our language, Papiamento. It was fun, a little bit tough. We had to invent new words in our language, com computational thinking. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. Um, another spin-off we do is um, safety for professionals. I don't know if you've interested in blockchain and web 3.0 and all that good stuff. But um, on Aruba, there's big interest and big risk. So what we kind of do is make sure people understand what it is by doing a project. Well, we're Raspberry Pi Foundation ethos. We do projects. And I'm actually at a seminar. You see that guy over there? He's looking at me like, oh man, you ruined my night because he was trying to in import or export to us NFTs. And I'm like, we don't need it. We can do it ourselves. So I run a meetup. I use meetup.org. And every month we get together and we talk. And sometimes I do a project like let's set up a, a wallet. 
I worked with a restaurant and we paid for the server of minting and now they all have a NFT created of a, with a local restaurant and they can use it for marketing, like a free bucket of beer at a cool event. But that's done in collaboration. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna go to my last part. Um, this is the utilities building. These are our endorsers. They fund the foundation. And we're sitting at a desk here with an architect, the liaison, the director, and that is Dr. Edward Chung. He is, the name is on the building we are the main tenant of and do our work. And we gave, here we are presenting what we do, including Kolo Dojo volunteering. And he used to be the principal engineer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He's one of our Arubans that went really far. And I see now, there's a little bit of Yale and Worcester there. <laughs> I didn't know. But the kids on Aruba have done a lot of stuff with him, and he interacts a lot with schools. And he's actually sent this kid a video. He did a Sprague Bird, that's a presentation at school. And uh, he reacts very aggressively. So let me share with you where we're going. This is gonna be a place where we continue our work and we're hopefully gonna scale it up. So it's going to become an energy and science center. And we're gonna do many activities. We're, we're part of that team to help with content. But what's really amazing is that the right people are investing into this. So our infrastructure company that is moving towards hydrogen needs a place for impact where the communities can come together and also piggyback on the transition. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. We even got the funding for an observatory. I have no idea how to do it, but we're going to do it anyway. I, I'm a hobby astronomer with my camera. I understand that a lot of smart telescopes use a Pi, actually. But I've aligned with the right people to make that happen for me. So this is the inside of the building. And we also need to bring in the right technology that the community can make use of. So now we're exploring, you know, uh, chat GPT and voiceover and all the good things that internet can offer and Microsoft Azure and Amazon. But they need to really experience it so you can so we're also we're using art. That photography is done by an Aruban, Heidel Froelich. He's a world-renowned astrophotographer. He takes horse head nebula shots, which you cannot believe. And we let them do the, do the work. Uh, and we are working with LEAD. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a leadership in environmental design. So they're sort of an auditor to make sure you're making a building that's within standards of the future. So last year I used to do a show, we used to call it Tech Impact. And it was me and my son, and we would talk about technology. And we were the most popular show on a local podcasting studio called Soppy Mix, which is like soup mix. And um, our local television station is waiting us for to, to restart and we're gonna be communicating with the public through the podcasting platform. So everything we do, we wanna promote. All the work we do with Coder Dojo, we wanna promote. So this is a floor map of our future studio office where we'll have that studio to do a lot of communication. And I'm sharing that with you because the connections I make today here at the Expo, I would love to communicate uh, through our system, which is a network device interface that is designed for me to plug in people and the telescope and anything really. So I want to reach out to the world and in my facility offer the content that we make with you guys. This is a screenshot of the future site. And um, this is the stuff we'll be, we'll be doing. And always projects based. We always wanna do projects. Um, we're working with the Space and Nature Foundation. They are the telescope experts. And one of the first projects we wanna do is a Raspberry Pi based uh, weather station across the island so we can gather data, which is impor important for the infrastructure uh, conglomerate. 
So that's going to be uh, the future, hopefully, if, if we're on schedule right now. Um, these are some of the partners we have locally. Interpol thinks it's interesting to keep working with us because a lot of the problems we have with cybersecurity is actually social engineering. So our podcast is a space that they want to come in and educate. And actually, our safeguarding partner officially is the instance that's responsible for that. They're called Code de Protection. And I would like to finish with um, what Tanya wrote for her minister. The future is bright as long as we continue to create digitally intelligent laborers, protect Aruba's development goals, and guarantee our participation in the borderless economy. And I hope maybe, just maybe, depending on your community, you can share whatever we're doing, and we would love to talk about it with you. And these are the sites you can visit to learn more. And I just found out today, Aruba.com, our official um, yeah, promotion platform, has a UK section, especially for you guys. And there are direct flights to Aruba since <laughs> last week. Starting tomorrow. Starting tomorrow. And that's our information. And if you want to see some surfing of mine, find me on Instagram, and you can get a bit jealous. And I thank you for your time. And let me give you a applause for all the great information you guys gave us. And I hope to see you more. Thank you.
I was not expecting that. I hope that was a clap for the whole conference. Do you know what? I was wondering, can I see over the top of this lectern? The answer is kind of. <laughs> if I go on my tiptoes still. We need a block for people under five foot six, maybe. Um, can you all see and hear me just yeah. about? Yeah. Wonderful. So I stood here pretty much 24 hours ago and welcomed some of you. Some of you weren't here and you've arrived today. So um, some new face in the audience. It feels like ages ago. I feel like I've learned so much, met so many people, and it's, I've got these key moments that I'm remembering, and then a big blur of lovely excitement and wonderfulness. And um, I'm just feeling really proud right now to be part of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, part of this community, running my own code club, uh, and just feeling really excited for the next steps and what's going to come next. So um, we're at the end, but it's not obviously the end of our community. It's, it's just this event. We've got one last session for you now. So um, we're going to have a panel discussion. I'll introduce the panel in just a moment, and then we'll have a few final words from us, from us Philip Colligan, as well.
to do that with kids. Uh, my wife's a teacher and my kids have gone through the, the Welsh Medium School. Uh, I was like, yeah, sign me up. And that's the one thing that brings me joy is to see the joy on the smile of the kids' faces when they've got their code to work. Yeah, that bit's really exciting, isn't it? That, that sort of high after all the frustration of you know, it not working and then suddenly there's that kind of shriek of excitement because it actually runs and that is a great feeling. So what, what about you, Cindy? How, how, how did you get involved? Where's your passion for this project come from? Um, I think uh, from being a mom, being it -er. So uh, like a lot of young girls, I wanted to become a teacher and I became something else. But because of this, I'm slightly a teacher, uh, giving my passion to uh, to my own kids and also to all these uh, these other kids. And you know what you said that the joy of seeing a kid like, wow, it worked, and oh, I did this, and that's that's what makes you continue doing it. Eh? Because you need something to start doing it, but then you also need something to continue doing it, and that's uh, the continuation is because of. Uh, the joy it brings but the first start for me it was like being a mom uh for my son uh he was seven now he's 17 so i'm in here for 10 years and i wanted to give him more than what he got at school at that time and that's how i roll in yeah that's just amazing so you've been doing it for 10 years and how long have you been how long have you been involved marcus oh uh about three years before covid and okay. about two years now yeah yeah, maybe a little longer. So like seven, yeah, eight years, seven, yeah, eight years, yeah, seven years, something like that. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, Lisa, what about you? How, how do it? Where, where's this passion come from? Yeah, so I took my daughter along to the first. I heard about this Kona Dojo thing. A uh, friend told me, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds good." Because I didn't know. I, I'm a software developer myself. I, I didn't know where to begin teaching her. You know, I can't just teach her Java at you know, eight year old. So, um, so I took her to you along and they said, oh, there's this program called Scratch. And she just got stuck in, made friends, you know, and they were all giggling. And, the, you know, it's the joy, isn't it? It's the happiness that when they made something work, that, you know, it really gives you the buzz. Um, but lately, I've had a lot of chats with parents. As a champion, you know, I get time to speak to the parents and, you know, they're saying the same, you know, I, I don't know. My, you know, my kids are really interested in tech. I don't know where to go, and I heard about you, and you know, just giving that opportunity to other people. Yeah, it's really satisfying. That's excellent. And what about yourself, Zoe? How did you get involved? Where's your passion come from? I was reflecting on this. So I have a 13-year-old nephew, and he got a Raspberry Pi, and this was way before my job existed. Um, and he was having a tinker around with it and I was learning from him and he was also doing scratch at school and he was just so able to follow his own interest within it and I remember just seeing how that lit passion in him and interest in him and that was something that we could connect on together um, so yeah he's now following that even further nothing to do with me um, but that's where it started for me. So at that point, this was way before I had this current job. Um, but when I saw this job, I thought, that's the one. And now, um, yeah, I run a code club at my son's school and just them being able to follow what they want to do. Like I give them an idea and then they go off in this direction and that direction. And that just excites them and keeps them engaged. It's wonderful. Yeah. So most of this is the reward of just being with those young people and just really having that high from enthusiasm that you're garnering in them. That's fantastic. So it's interesting that um, a few of you have mentioned, you know, it started off with a, a child or a family member. And one of the things that's interesting, I think, is, you know, how do we tackle, or, you know, how do we bring in people who maybe don't have that supportive parent and or children who are more disadvantaged or, you know, how, how can we work on reducing the digital divide? And I know, Cindy, that's something you're particularly passionate about. So I wonder if I could start with you. Yeah, Good. maybe then I should start with our uh, yearly event for girls, yeah. Good Virtual for Girls, where we um, don't exclude boys, but they do not subscribe because it's called for girls. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, most of the, the, the coaches during the day are women, not all of them. Yeah, Ivan is one of the non-female coaches, <laughs> for example. Um, and, and we see it works. So it's, it's like a safe environment. There are no boys, little boys, uh, a lot of female coaches. So for girls, it's a safe environment. We make it fun with a goodie, with some um, yeah, um, side animation, uh, what we call the tech fair and so on. So safe environment. And we do see a lot of those girls then go into a regular dojo. Uh, it's like my own daughter asked a friend to come to the Coder Dojo and she never came. She asked her to come to for girls. And now every month she's at our dojo. So that's like a result that it works. Uh, in Belgium, we also try to um, look for organizations that work with the youngsters that we might not reach and that they host the doyo because they already reach those kids because they live in a certain area or whatever. And then uh, we also have one, but it's on, it's on a slow pace now because of COVID, but at uh, a clinics. So we, then we run a doyo at a clinic with uh, kids that are sick for a longer time. Uh, but there are a lot of restrictions. And for the moment, it's still not possible to continue that. But these are a, a few small things. Like For girls, is a big event, connecting with organizations that already target those people and already reach those people. And then things like, uh, like in the clinics. Yeah. What, what about in Manchester, Lisa? What's the situation like in Manchester? And how, how do you sort of reach out to those less advantaged um, communities? We do a lot of pop-ups pop-ups in libraries um, so then they just happen to visit and they see they don't know about us I think um, yeah they can come up you know come and have a try and then we can advertise and um, they, they can find out about us um, and we've got the equipment as well we you know fortunate that we can donated some laptops and we've got pies and a lot you know, some kids don't have the equipment at home, and so they're able to come and have people mentoring them as well. Yeah, fantastic. And Marcus in Wales? Well, in my previous code club <coughs> before COVID, we had about 50 50 split between boys and girls, which was pretty cool. Um, the girls were really engaged, and the boys liked playing games. There were a couple of, a couple of boys that did actually like coding. But in the code club I'm in, I'm in now, which is also in a school, uh, we get between 50 and 70% girls. And um, I'm, I'd like to think it was a masterful stroke on my behalf, but it's not. It's just coincidence that we run it on a Friday lunchtime, and that Friday is when the AstroTurf is open. So every boy who wants to play football plays football. Those who don't like football come to code club and all of the girls come to code club <laughs> that's <laughs> a very kind move isn't it <laughs> yeah excellent so a bit of timing and location is obviously the way you talk about the libraries and you know maybe more accessible spaces that people can get to into easily so what do we how do we or you know you in terms of your role as director of code clubs how, how are you helping to support or encourage us to support less advantaged communities so we are running training focused in particular areas where we know there's more of a need. Um, so that's training for teachers and educators um, or other people that are interested in volunteering at code clubs. Um, we're also helping people find funding. So we just had a session at the conference with advice about how to find funding for a, a dojo or a code club. Um, and it really varies so much depending on the location, what the needs are. Um, in terms of other things that we offer, we also produce lots of um, resources that are very simple to understand and accessible to everybody. Um, and we're trying to learn more about how to support different communities and not think of this in a homogenous way as people who are educationally disadvantaged, like really get to know individual communities and talk to them um, work with local partners to find out what the needs are, whether it's um, a language barrier or a lack of equipment or um, misconceptions about coding and computing. And we're finding that it's really varied um, and we're just learning as we go and trying to get better. Yeah, I, I was in Marcus's session earlier where he was talking about being involved in the translation project and 
that sounded really good. And you brought in people from work to help with that. Do you want to just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. That's right. We had uh, my company has a, a, what, what we call a Martin Luther King Day, uh, International Day of Service, on every January sixteenth, where uh, the whole company, so it's roughly seven thousand people across the world, uh, get the day off to do some um, volunteering work within the community. So we have people cleaning beaches in California or um, cleaning canals in Amsterdam. And uh, I thought, well, Wales is just cold and damp in January. The last thing I want to do is go outside. So, <laughs> and so there were others across uh, uh, mainland Europe and uh, North America who thought the same as me. And uh, I managed to get, um, I put a call out on the work intranet and uh, about 21 people uh, responded uh, and by the, by the time the January the 16th came along we had um, seven volunteers uh, coding uh, translating into six languages 21 different projects that were on the uh, uh, code club and Raspberry Pi foundation uh, translation list yeah. so uh, it was a pretty good day so well, yeah, and a phenomenal amount of work in a day just to make that match progress is phenomenal uh, it was interesting because I was, I was also, I've been sort of dropping into different sessions during the day and um, I was in, is our colleague from Greece here? Oh, oh yes, yeah, I was in your session where you were talking about the challenges of running international sessions, which was really interesting, like where you're partnering with different countries, like you talked about Iraq and the challenges of communication and, you know, using maybe a mentor, two mentors who spoke English to translate to the children in both directions. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like sometimes as an educator, you think teaching is really challenging <laughs> and the idea of having to do it with a translator or using resources that are not in the language of the person is, is just another thing in terms of the divide, isn't it? Because I, I always feel so guilty relying on the fact that everyone else speaks English. You know, and it, I, I think it's a it's a typical guilty feeling. So we got Cindy here from Belgium and, you know, she's sitting having this conversation. And of course, Marcus, whose first language is also not English, <laughs> having this conversation. But it, it's phenomenal, really, that you can make this work for so many young people. And also the translating resources is part of that. So I think big shout out there. If anyone else wants to translate a resource, then get in touch with us. So. Okay, so my next question then, really, this is the frightening question, because it's about AI and machine learning. And obviously, you know, it's bombarding us in the press at the moment. Like, you can't open a newspaper or a magazine without maybe being terrified about what AI is going to do to us. So it's very interesting, because clearly, you know, when we were young, this technology did not exist. But for our young people, this is going to be the reality. This is going to be their life. So I, I really just wanted to know, like, have you tried to introduce machine learning and AI in anything you've done at the moment? Um, uh, would you like to? And what do you see as the challenges for that? So where shall I start? Marcus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, to answer your first question, no. <laughs> we haven't introduced AI or machine learning uh, yet, to be honest, I don't really know whether I'd want to yet, yeah. but it's certainly something that is raising its head and is getting a lot of press. Uh, how would I approach it? Um, I would give the fun, I put the fun side in first, like something like uh, chat GPT or um, you know, don't use this to you to do your homework kind of thing. But the main thing that I would want to get across is that it's only a tool. Yeah. Like a search engine is a tool or a computer is a tool. It's just a tool to be used for good. It can be used for evil. So that's where ethics comes along. So there has to be a strong ethical uh, dimension to the use of AI yeah. and once you get kids you know understanding that early then the rest is uh, is easy yeah yeah and, and thinking of it as a tool is really important isn't it Cindy have any of the young people that you work with have any of them asked about machine learning or AI 
uh, I run my own dojo. At my own dojo, I don't know, but we have like uh, 120 dojos in Belgium. So I'm sure the question <laughs> popped up when I see them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm sure the question uh, popped up. And I think indeed the importance is, is not that we learn them what it is, but that we learn them how to use it correctly. Like in, uh, you see them in Google and they do like, weird things and they say like maybe it's better to do it like this or if it, if you use this search term you will get a better result and maybe to guide them into this process because they will use it and they will also use it without us so maybe our input can be using it correctly or or or, or yeah on a, on a good way yeah yeah, no, absolutely. But Lisa, you got anything else to add on that? Um, so. No, we haven't taught it. Um, I don't know anyone who knows a lot about it. So, yeah. But we've got a very vibrant te uh, tech community in Manchester. So I'll probably put, put a message out and ask someone to come maybe have a chat. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you know, if you put on Twitter, maybe someone would answer as well. So. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a challenge for yeah, educators, yeah. I think. So, to... and I think you still you still need to know the basic. You know, machine can't code everything. So. <laughs> yeah, Zoe, anything else? That, anything? Any insights that you have on this? Yeah, so we are doing research around AI, and some of you were here for Jane's talk yesterday morning. Um, there's an opportunity to get involved with our research, and. We are also running a pilot project at the moment. I know a load of you were in the session that Mark ran earlier. So um, there are opportunities to experiment and learn with us and to try out some of our resources that are teaching young people about AI um, and how to use it in terms of their learning as well. So I just encourage you to keep an eye out in our newsletters and on our website um, or come and talk to some of us before the end of the day as well if you do. If you are interested, don't be afraid. It's all about um, yeah, opening our minds to understanding it so that we can help young people with that as well. Yeah, fantastic. So my next question then, really, I think you can all look at Philip when you answer this question, because my next question, I know, <laughs> Philip, it's like, you just he's just sitting there thinking, now, what's she going to do next? OK, so what I really want to know is, is there anything else that the foundation could do to help you, you know, to, to actually help make your life easier or, you know, to help you do new and different things with your dojos and coach clubs. So, Lisa, you can start this time. What, what, what would you like? What would you like from the foundation? Um, actually, I, we get asked a lot about, for the older ones, that work experience. So maybe some way of linking companies to provide work experience for our lingers. Okay, that's a... Excellent ask, actually, and particularly with, you know, more emphasis on vocational education and things like that. I think kids, you know, they, like a lot of children don't, or young people don't really know what jobs are out there either. So, um, yeah, that's a great ask. Cindy, what can we do for you? Yeah, I think, like, uh, things like this, connecting with each other, people have all their own strengths. We don't know that. We, we are already uh, ongoing in Belgium for a while, and we went to sessions with topics we've never heard of before. So I think that's that's a nice stuff. We learned like how to do Python on a different way or how to use stuff on a different way. And, and it, it's with these live events, but it can also be online, or whatever, just meeting each other and, and knowing what to do. Uh, I think uh, one of us, uh, for us, an embot is something every dojo uses, but we ha we talk to people who've never heard of embot before. For us, it's so obvious. So it works yeah. in two directions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So more, more conferences as well, more get together. Not let's share it. Yeah, which, which will be great fun. So let's do that. Marcus. Nothing. <laughs> so, a few brief tips. So don't ask for anything. I'm at the cutting edge of okay. computing education, if we want to call it, because I'm just introducing coding um, to year sixes, key stage two kids, and I don't want to blow anyone's trumpet, but everything that we do is provided by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, the resources online, um, the support that we've had from the people, uh, from, from the foundation itself. 
I don't think I can think of anything other than why don't you hold a, like a club's conference now and again <laughs> uh, that yeah. comes to mind. So uh, keep it up. Yeah, that's great. And I think we all, we all sort of really appreciate, I think, this chance, like I said at the beginning, to network with each other and to actually have those conversations that, you know, a lot of the time you're in the classroom or you're behind a computer screen. And it's, it's great to sort of reinforce how valuable it is to interact with other people. So my, my final question for you all, really, or discussion point is just like, you know, what, what, what would you like to share, I think, from this couple of days? So, you know, that could be like sharing something about the people you've met or, you know, a particular session that you went to enjoy, that you went to, or just a discussion that you've had with somebody that you really enjoyed. So um, I keep on picking Marcus because he's right next to me. <laughs> Skip Marcus, we'll come back to you in the end. So Cindy. What have you really enjoyed? What's your takeaway from this? What I enjoy session? from from these kind of mm. events is uh, a lot of times when we go to events, it's more business-like and we're there in a non-profit role. Uh, so the vibe is different. And I like this vibe better. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's that's really a nice thing. And just yes, meeting people from really all over the world, not only at Europe, but we're officially not in Europe or not, so I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be here all night if we start that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but like meeting people from all over the world, uh, how, uh, for me, because I'm in, in Code Dojo for, for 10 years, like getting to know more about Code Club and how that works and what things we have in common and what things we don't have in common and why and what works and what doesn't work. I think that's what I take home. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And what about yourself, Lisa? What, what, what's your, what was your highlight of the... Uh, just chatting to everyone um, and being able to share, you know, our worries, you know, things that worry, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing enough? Um, I think we all share the same worries. And yeah, and COVID was a big disruptor, wasn't it, in yeah. terms of what we do. So to some extent, there's had to be a bit of reinventing and restarting. Yeah. Which so I feel I'm really boosted from this weekend. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. So I'm going to come back to Marcus now. Marcus, what's your takeaway? Um, lots of swag. <laughs> 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 but seriously, seriously though, uh, thinking of the conversations that I've had, um, it's, it was great to meet the Raspberry Pi staff, Code Club, Code Dojo, um, just everyone, you're just so fabulous and you make our lives so much easier, uh, us on the, the cutting edge or uh, the plankton in the food chain, as I like to yeah. call ourselves, <laughs> I call myself anyway. Um, but the conversations that I've had with teachers and the sessions that they've that they've shown, uh, they've just like been mind blowing. I, I feel so um, inspired to make right, yeah. just subtle changes and to do a lot more investigation and research myself. But uh, it's very inspiring, uh, very motivating. So um, yeah, that's what we're taking back. Excellent. And so, what about you? You've got a long to do list that you're bringing back. Yeah. <laughs> for sure yeah everything from learning from all the presentations in here this morning little things like i didn't know that you could do a screen mask that rodri talked about where you can just have one line of code for people with dyslexia that's changed my world um to having a go with machine learning and our new resources myself because i hadn't seen them to conversations with people over lunch different ones for the main course and pudding and enjoying all of that yeah, it's just been a wonderful 24 hours. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've enjoyed it enormously. And my, my, my biggest takeaway is actually I've got loads of new contacts on LinkedIn and I have the most eclectic LinkedIn <laughs> list. And I think I've really raised that game on that today because I've met so many people from different places, different work environments, you know, different parts of the world, you know, incredible. So... So I think that quite neatly brings us the end of our allotted time. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to our panellists. <laughs> and I'd like to bring Philip back on the stage. Okay. Okay. Um, just now. Uh, yesterday, I was horribly upstaged by chat GPT. Um, and today, slightly so by Zoe, because I'm going to do the thanks again. 
it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. But I'm glad you got a warm up then because we're going to do it with applause. Okay, so uh, let's try warm, warm. If you if you if you can clap with your hands, you can stamp with your feet or whoop and yell. I don't mind, but you know, let's get some stretches in first. So let's thank the panel again. It's good. I'm going to give you a little breather while I say a few words. Keep the hands moving. And um, what an incredible day or, or day and a half. Um, there's so much, wasn't there? Uh, incredible um, content ideas. Uh, you're all brilliant. Um, I had uh, fantastic conversations outside of the sessions, as several other people have said. And what I was struck by is the sort of passion, commitment, the sort of how you're overcoming challenges, the generosity, um, all of that, which I, I saw in every conversation that I had. I know where Aruba is and that there's a daily flight there or something now. Um, the, the Raspberry Pi Foundation team will get it when I say Aruba is apparently the new Hawaii. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, and so many ideas, which I know Zoe's been, and the team have been writing down for what we could be doing differently. Marcus, you're a generous, kind human being, as all Welshmen are. Um, but you're wrong, of course. We can be doing lots of things better and differently. Um, and uh, I've got a big list of those and uh, lots of valuable feedback for us. I think one of the most, you know, this is important for all sorts of reasons, this event. But one of the things for me and the team is hearing directly from all of you about your experience and how we can do more to support you. And perhaps a little uh, overwhelming to cram so much into one um, uh, into one day or just over 24 hours, but efficient, um, uh, if nothing else. And so we're going to come back to the applause in a moment. Brace yourselves. Um, but first, what I want you to do is all just take a moment in silence awkward silence, um, just to reflect on the last day or so, and perhaps try and hone in on one thing, and I'm sure there'll be more than one, but one thing that you would like to do differently as a result of a conversation you had or a talk you heard or something you uh, did, something you would like to go back and implement after today. And I'm going to leave you in silence just to think about that for a minute. Okay. Has anyone got one? Anyone want to share one? Yes. I want to start printing the, the bodies again. My digital team are gonna their, their hearts are breaking all over the UK. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. Did you hear Phil Howell's heartbreak? <laughs> uh, but you're right. You're right. Uh, yeah, good one. Anyone else? Yeah. I can hear other members of my team's heart singing, you know, sort of breaking hearts and making people happy at the same time. Anyone else? Yes, at the back. I'm with you. Of course you are. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Code in space, what's not to like? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, we didn't even have to plant that question. That's brilliant. That's what everyone should do. There's plenty of time um, still um, to take part. Look, I, I think, you know, these, these events are brilliant in and of themselves, but actually the real value comes afterwards. If there's things that you've learned or things that you know you reflect on in your own practice that then you can take forward. And some of that will be about staying in touch and communicating with 
other people that you've met here or the foundation team you know this is a sort of process you know it's a thing that we need to keep going this conversation right hands at the ready are you ready a quick few thank yous and then we're out of here and um, so firstly i want to say thank you to churchill college for looking after us and feeding us all so well i don't know if they can hear us in the ab team at the back but thank you to everybody at churchill college thank you to Helen, two Helens and Anula, who are the organizing team behind the scenes. Thank you for everything you've done. Um, I want to say, uh, you'll hopefully indulge me on this one. I want to say thank you to the Raspberry Pi Foundation team. I, I, I popped in, you know, I audited lots of your talks. I popped in and saw you and you were all absolutely brilliant. I'm really, really proud to be part of the team. So thank you so much for that. Right, so Thank you to everyone who presented or organized a session. What an incredibly brave thing to choose to do, uh, particularly those of you who aren't trained teachers, um, uh, but you were amazing. Uh, so thank you to everybody that ran a session. And finally, thank you to all of you for coming and spending your weekend with us. It's been an absolute privilege, and uh, I look forward to doing it again next year, either in Aruba or somewhere else. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye.